you know what they want to die where they want to die they don't want to die in Vrindavan or Navadev Yes. You know, let me tell you, the largest uh, bulk of conversion happened post-independence. The state should have, con the job of the state is to control the violence. Absolutely. But they are very, very angry. I have never seen my taste so angry in my life and it's alarming for me, people like me. Ramit Desai, Professor Bimola Kojam, welcome to the Abhijit Chawda podcast. Today we are discussing a very serious topic, the situation in Manipur. And we're going to do it in a very calm, composed manner, not like what's what's typically done in TV debates. So let me put some uh, pers give some perspective, personal perspective. I was in Manipur in February. I attended a aero sports festival in a place called Pubala, which is in the Imphal Valley itself. It right. is on the way to Churachandpur. It's on the way to Churachandpur, right? And uh, very successful thing. The the chief minister was there. Mr. Ramda Sathavalaji was there, the union minister, and so on. And I could see a significant security presence. Mm -hmm. And Manipur of late has been doing very well economically and all. So I was wondering why is there so much security here? And I had uh, lunch with a bunch of very bright young army officers as well. So I was there in February. In May, just two and a half or so months later, Manipur is burning. So that's what I would like to talk about today. I would like to understand what's happening from both of you. So one of the issues we in India face is the distortion of our history. Our history is distorted and that opens up, opens us up to all kinds of attacks and narratives uh, made by foreigners and made by people who are against us. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to Manipur, we just don't know the history. Nobody in India is taught Manipur history or the history of the northeast of India. So I would like to start with a little bit of a discussion on history. So that we get the correct perspective about this uh, conflict. So I'll ask this question to both of you. There is something called the Manipuri language. It's been around for roughly 2000 years, right? And the question I would like to ask very simple is which ethnic group is the originator of the Manipuri language? Do I take this one? <laughs> yeah. See, this the, the community that we call it Maitai or Mitai, this is also two Maitais. ways of Maitais and sometimes people write it as a group of people who think that it should be Mitai rather than Maitai, but mm -hmm. both are interchangeably used. Uh, when you say Manipuri language, it means a language spoken by this community. The Maitais. The Maitais. Right. Then you have to second part, you have to understand Maitai is not uh, and how do you look at Maitai as a community? Because when you say Maitai, there are people think that we are seven clan today. It's a very popular narrative. So mm -hmm. it's represented by seven colors of a flag. The flag, yes. 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 But there are uh, people who do not belong to those seven clan. Mm -hmm. But yet, psychologically, otherwise in their cultures, their language, part of the same communities that the Brahmins, which we call Bamons. Bamons. They are not part of the seven, but they will consider themselves as Maitis. Maitis. So it's, a, it's a intertwined mm. in our rituals and others. So it is part of the same organic community at that level. But the non-Brahmin, there are also an, uh, other groups. Mm. A lot of family surname. For example, I my family surname is Akoijam. Mm -hmm. So there are family surname. All these surnames belong to one of these seven clans. Seven clans. But there are surnames which doesn't belong to, which do not belong to any of these clans. Okay. But still, there are Maitai. Maitai. So okay. Maitai is, to my mind, is a very evolved community. It's, mm -hmm. it's like a melted from different speakers. So you have multiple languages for water we have say Ising and Lija for year for example you will have Kum as well as Chahi so this is as anthropologically speaking it means that different speakers of languages have melted together mm -hmm. uh, incidentally like the term like Kum mm -hmm. which is meant for season or year which is used mm -hmm. in in literature or even in our day-to-day -day uses is, is the same as the Kukichin group Mm -hmm. like the same word mm -hmm. kum so maitai as a language is this one right when we say that mm -hmm. this language is shared by another group of people who are, we call it maitai pangal maitai pangals and uh, pangal is a corrupted version of they said bengal 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 from bengal and uh, pangal is that marked by religion Otherwise, the language is the same. Hmm. Initially, it's, I think it is a South Asian experience. Initially, they are even the dressing and others were more or less the same. So you can see in, over the years, because of the exposure, there is a tendency to have an Islamic representation in terms of their dressing code. Yes. I remember, uh, you know, a similar thing happened in Bangladesh, for example. There was a professor 
I, I remember who was part of our team of studies in CSD as well. I used to work. So they said, you will see a lot of Bengali sari mm -hmm. in the 40s and 50s. Now you don't get to see that. You know, there is a change. in So similar kind of thing happened in Manipur among the Pangal groups. Otherwise, initially when we were younger, mm -hmm. uh, quite a you know, Uniform. uh, uniformity is there except for the religion and so on. Yes. But the language is the same. So right. Maitai has become an ethno name for Manipuri in that sense. Right. Manipuri is a term that we use in two senses mm -hmm. normally. One is in what I will call it the linguistic cultural sense. Mm -hmm. So the one who speaks the language. this language. Yes. So even if you are from Tripura or from Myanmar or Bangladesh or Assam, or even in Navadiv in Bengal, there used to be a time when even in UP, especially in Vrindavan area, uh, in the census you will have this Manipuri speakers. Okay. That's a particular site. So, in that sense, the one who is marked by this language is mm -hmm. what you call it Manipuri. Yeah. In the other sense, is a geopolitical sense, the one who belongs to the state, state of Manipur. Yeah, that's the other one. Uh, Manipuri Naga, sometimes people use that mm -hmm. word, you know. So, Manipuri is in that sense. Right. Uh, you know, a geopolitical sense of the term. Part of our crisis, this is something that I have uh, written in, in, in a memorial lecture in 2006, is the mismatch between this, uh, you know, geopolitical sense of the word Manipuri and the, uh, you know, cultural linguistic sense of the word Manipuri. That's why some of the tribal will say, I am not a Manipuri. Right. Uh, in, in the linguistic culture, linguistic in, sense. In, especially linguistic sense. So Maite is a far more complicated community, is a complex society, it's not merely those seven clans. Yes, it's, it's, has been it's my broader. Argument. It's a broader, yes. as, and at one level it has become a generic name f for a larger cultural ethos, you know, who belong to that one. So if you say the origin of Manipur would be this one then, this community, the linguistically the Maitais. Yes. But this has evolved through mixing of various communities, yes. webs of migration, as well as people who have been probably evolved from that area in terms of, uh, say, Paleolithic period, mm -hmm. Neolithic period. It's quite possible. Mm -hmm. but it, despite possible resentment by people who wants to claim that everybody origin is from there, from amoeba onwards, kind of a theory, <laughs> in the name of indigeneity, mm. I would differ. Yes. But I would say that, yes, there must be people who evolve from the Paleolithic site to the Neolithic sites. We have those sites. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there are also waves of migration, which is quite obvious in ancient texts in Manipur called Nongpok Thong, which mm. is the window from the east, and, and Nongchuk Thong, Mane. West. The Western door. So there are texts mm -hmm. which talks about the migration patterns of. So Manipur is evolved out of these mixtures of that one over the over the centuries. So right. that is Manipur in, in my sense. But Rami, would you like to add something? Well, obviously uh, the professor here has given us a great overview of what this is. But I would have to agree with him. You know, these are ancient uh, populations. Mm -hmm. You know that have probably seen a little migration, you know, inwards and outwards and, you know, have taken all of that and created what we see today, you know. But having said that, I also feel that over a period of time, this sort of ancient connections have been lost. Like you said, that we don't learn about it. We don't, you know, study this in our school systems. But also for a very long time, we didn't talk about it as part of our mainstream consciousness, yes. you know, so we had no idea uh, uh, you know, who Manipuris were, let alone who Manipuris were, we didn't uh, give that kind of credit of these being independent or different cultures and civilizations. So for us, the Northeast was Northeast. There wasn't a difference between the Manipuris, the Assamese, mm. the Tripura in our mind. Yes. Of course, if we were to take it back into recent history, I think a lot of the policies post uh, the Battle of Plassey when the British set their sights on the Northeast and entered the Northeast and realized that, you know, there were lots of populations that were very uh, resistant to their interference. Um, the policies that were brought in uh, became a major cause of this sort of divide that we see today. Yes, yes. And uh, also over and above that, I am of the firm belief, uh, and because this is what I study, is that uh, these nomenclatures, you know, like tribes, non-tribes, you know, these came very later. Yes. You know, they were included by the British in the early censuses, you know, animism, tribal. You know, again, these became 
commentaries of divisions so that they could define it in their head. From their perspective. From their perspective. Yeah, you know, for us, these populations were populations. We live side by side yes. all the time. You know, let me, if you allow me, Please. elaborate this for a couple of minutes because this is a complicated thing. It's become so mainstream in our heads now that we think there was nothing prior to this. So the, uh, the British Civil uh, Services Education used to um, teach anthropology. Anthropology was a colonial arm. Yes. So that when they came into countries like that, they could distinguish between natives and themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, so there yes. was this sense of otherhood, otherhood, which we adopted. Yes, wholesale. And now we think of it as us and the other. Exactly. And that became like a, you know, dividing. So we are using their lens to see it. We are using their lens to see this we are also using their divisions to see this and their lens to formulate policies formulate policies based on the divisions now yes. a lot of tribal populations you see in these areas um you know were not uh, scheduled hmm. because there was this great need to preserve their identity they were scheduled because they didn't the british didn't want them interfering with their trade routes yes. you know yes. or didn't want them attacking them hmm. But we have sort of, because we have not thought of it from our own internal perspective, we have uh, sort of cemented these divisions. Indeed. And therefore, now we see the kind of, uh, you know, uh, deficit of trust or the sense of otherness. And of course, then there is the geographical, yes. uh, you know, chicken's neck that mm -hmm. gives us the sense of distance. Mm -hmm. But that is for a you know, different discussion. Right. But having said that, I think all these historical factors, you know, have come to have, you know, come together to this point where now we have to discuss the differences between uh, ancient civilizations. I just want to add what, what she said. I think she has rightly pointed it out. Let's mm -hmm. say less, we, we can think about the specificities of Manipur, mm -hmm. but we must also know the larger context within with certain dynamics. I think she has rightly pointed out. One is how the Europeans have tried to define, classify, and control and govern. Yes. That's how the centuries, you know, it's a known case in Indian, mm -hmm. South Asia. Or what's a work of, she will know it better because in anthropologists like uh, Bernard Cohen's mm -hmm. centuries and, you know, objectification of caste, how people were trying to slot in one category. Mm -hmm. If you have a Jani you, then you will be this. But they get confused that. The same thing is used by the other castes in some other places. Mm -hmm. So British have created and there's Indian scholars like Sudip Tokaviras talks about fuzzy community. Mm -hmm. The British have made it like a bounded, enumerated communities with farm boundaries. Mm -hmm. So this classificatory scheme introduced by the British as they tried to govern this place have created many of these I I ideas. You use the word like it is through the lens of other. Yes. It's like what the feminists would say, you know, a woman tends to look at themselves exactly in the way a man would look at them. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's just like the European lens through which we, yes. and I call this, I often been using this, these colonial categories have been the basis for uh, your sense of identities. Mm. Uh, I think that that is more sharply felt, I must say, in India's northeast for one reason, because at least in, in South Asia, you have this scholarship for a long, long time which has been questioning colonial categories. Correct. Yes. And so on. So you have an academic cultures here in the in the in the mainstream, mm -hmm. which I mean it is ironic at one level. I'm part of that in, institutional mechanism at the same time. Yes. But I happen to come from there and my background. But I get a feeling, this has been my feeling over the years. Mm -hmm that we don't quite critically engage with these colonial categories and literature. Mm -hmm. So we continue to hold on to. Yes. Even when you use, I'll give you one classic example in Manipur in the same sense. Uh, the imageries that they have, this is my feeling, I could be wrong, uh, but that is what I have been articulating it. When the, they say it like the Maitais, the Manipuris in the valley, when they encounter, they call it a singular oasis of civilization, comparative civilization, okay. Okay. surrounded by Seveses and Eke tribes. Mm -hmm. Now, I thought uh, this gives a clear boundary between two, but we forget that in their leap experiences, they have been interacting. Absolutely, absolutely. It's not, and then I realized that this could be the same imageries they have about the barbarians attacking the Greco-Roman civilization. Exactly. You know? yes. So this is the scheme through which they try to look at. Yes. And so they made a series of blunders like this yes. and we have internalized. That we have internalized. And the Seves has yes. become tribe and a non-tribe. Yes. You see, yes. the government of India 
consolidated this by Absolutely. scheduled tribe and yes. non-scheduled yes. tribe. Yes. So then we internalize it. Yes. And even the geography, which I have been saying, and I don't know why some people got it a shock. They thought that they have never thought about it. I said, I'm not saying something like a rocket science. It's simple. It's a geological theory of how the Himalayans were formed, how indo gangetic plains were formed, mm. the collision between the Eurasia plate and the Indian plate. Yes. You know, 50 million years ago, then how this was elevated. Manipur is part of that elevated yes. mountainous regions. Yes. And valley, by definition, is part of a mountainous regions. Mm. So we talk about this oval set valley, but there are a lot of other valleys. Yes. But so we have this false categories mm. through which we have been defining ourselves. Mm, yes. The whole crisis is rooted in those things. So yeah. if you wanted to solve, my, my feeling is that you need to have, a, a, you know, critical engagement with these categories. Yes. And then create a, a, a linkages, mm. a yes. different linkages among that one. Mm. Uh, and then you will be able to see. And I also feel that sometimes there's state-centric history writing is also at fault. Mm -hmm. If you write the emergence of Manipur, then obviously you will fall on this emergence of the valley yeah. states yeah. and how a particular state become very powerful and that becomes the nomenclature of the Maitais. Mm. In fact, all the seven clans were independent principalities. principalities yes. They were subjugated and slowly they accepted. Similarly, there are tribal villages yes. which were under the, you know, uh, suzerainty of these powers. Yes. So that's the contestation. You will mm. see, Remy, you must have seen it. Yes. Money, we have never been under Maitai kings and so forth. Mm. Uh, that's very unfortunate. If yes. you go beyond this politics and see yourself as a scholar, mm. then you will realize that there's an emergence of a state there. Absolutely. And the kind of sovereign power they exercise is uh, you know, not in the classical sense of today's sense of a nation state, mm -hmm. where some scholars like Hobsbawm would say the state sovereign power resides in each and every square centimeters of the territory. Mm -hmm. That is not the old sovereign forms. Yes. You know, different forms where there are people call it segmentary states in Chola dynasty, for example, yes. if you see their state. Mm -hmm. So different kind of sovereign power was operational. There was a state that emerges. Yes and uh, the kind of power relationship we must understand. But today's Manipur is not that imperial. It's not that. It's not That's that. also fall with my community, especially my taste suffer mm -hmm. from what I call it imperial nostalgia. Okay. Uh -huh. now, you should be able to reinvent yourself. Ob absolutely. Our king is the wrong one. There was a king. Mm -hmm. I don't want to call it as our king. Mm -hmm. If you go on then, you know, you will create a subjugated fellow citizen out of your own fellow citizen. That's how the tribal resentment is also there. Mm, okay. So overall historical background is very crucial. Mm, yes. How many of these categories and perspective were created. Yes. And I would say if people say there is a continuity between the colonial and the post-colonial in South Asia, mm -hmm. Manipur is the epitome of that one. Right. And the rest of the country, thanks to many of these scholars, they started debunking, decolonizing it, reinterrogating, you know, the, the way history is understood, the way various categories of knowledge is understood. But yes. in the notice, we haven't done that. So it's not the process has, hasn't even started yet. Yeah, so it is started, it's started, but uh, it is not as tangible. But unfortunately, some of these scholars from that part of the world who are uh -huh. teaching in many universities in the uh -huh. rest of the country abroad. Uh -huh. Instead of doing that, I realized over these months also, they are playing politics. Mm. And they're trying to uh, consolidate these categories rather than perpetuating them. Backing them. Yes, yes, correct. That I've seen this one. Mm. I think she must have also seen it. Absolutely. I feel it very bad and mm. sad for them also. Right, so we have established that the Manipuri language is the language of the Maitais. Now, Manipur has a 2000 year old plus history. But uh, can I correct me? Let's, this should not sound like a hegemonic. It, it is what it is, sir. It is what it is. Ah, but it is like a lingua franca. Yes. One tribe speaks, All even when they gali is to the Maitais. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware. Using yeah. in, in Maitai law. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. That's so it should not be looked as a. It's not a hegemonic thing, it's just a fact of history. It's, yeah, you it's right. It's a fact. It's a fact. Now, Manipur has a 2000 plus year old recorded history, a chronology of kings, the Chaitar al Kumbhava. That, that does. Uh, 2000 plus years of kings, various dynasties, I think Toja dynasty and so yeah, That was a ruling. Yes. So each of these kings, which ethnicity did they belong to? See, 
Today, everybody will say it is Maitais, but you, I told you the Maitais evolve over yeah. the years. They were different. Today, if I write, if you mm. see my full name, Angom Chai, right? Angom Chai Bimola Kwezen. Angom is the name of one of the clan. Yes. So Angom used to have a king. Mm -hmm. So there used to be even a ceremonial king, even in the Maitai, because it is considered to be one of the last who are subjugated by the, you know, who asserted his power. So there's a symbolism of the Angom king. Mm -hmm. So every principality had a king, so, yes. so does the tribe. Mm -hmm. But it was a, there an overall suzerain power is that the one who sits in Kangla. Yes, Kangla. Yeah, Kangla Fort, he yes. was that. And he came to be known as the Maitai king. Yes, the overall king. Nithauza dynasty. Okay. So I'll tell you, there's a figure of an Angom king. Mm -hmm. So wherever the coronation happened of the Maitai king, the first guy, the Angom king will first sit on the uh, symbolically, he will be the one who will sit on that first. Mm -hmm. The torn land, yeah. the mm -hmm. king will sit. Mm -hmm. So Angom was, even in the 1891 war, you will see this figure of the Angom king. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm saying is that Maitai's evolution is Maitai is that the one who sits in Kangla. Okay. But today everybody, I also am a Maitai Angom. Yes. There could be a period in history in the past mm -hmm. where we don't consider ourselves as yeah. Maitai, but mm -hmm. rather Maitai is the one who sits in Imphal kind of thing. Mm. But today we are all Maitais. Yes. You see that that's what I'm saying. Mm. So I, I think we must realize that so essentially there's a Maitai king, but I am very cautious. But Maitai should not be uh, in an anachronistic fashion, should be fossilized like throughout 2000 years is the same community. We have evolved. Mm. But it is Ningthauza dynasty. Mm -hmm who rule from Kangla, who yes. become the overall powerful yeah. uh, power, political power. And from today's perspective, they are not Nagas or Kukis, they are Maitais. Even the so-called Nagas or Kukis, some Brothers. people say yeah. uh, that, that coronation ceremony, mm -hmm. what we call it today, it is a retrospective reading, you know, an anachronistic yes. way of reading it, yes. that he will wear Naga dress mm -hmm. during the coronation period. Mm -hmm which is Kabuis and Tankuls and others. Yes. So that must be also part of the state formation process, Re a ritual, what people call a ritual sovereignty. Right. So ritually you wanted to represent them also. Them no? as so, well. wear, yes, huh? yes. so that linkages are there. That's why I said... If so the Naga and Maitre linkages are very evident. Yeah, ma many people say closer, but even the Kukichin groove, linguistically, we are part of it throughout yes. all these reigns. Yes. But different people have different uh, identities. Uh -huh. But majorly it is the tribes like Liang Mais, uh -huh. Tankus, Kabuis. Those are Naga tribes. It is Naga category, yes. so uh, much more closer. Right. Uh, and, and, and there are scholars who told me there are sections of Maitais who also come from the uh, Kukichin group as well. Mm -hmm. And hence the word like Kum and Kum. It's like if you want to write poetry in English, they said you throw in a little bit of friends mm -hmm. to make it softer and yes. romantic. Yes. So people mm -hmm. say if in Hindi film songs, you have a lot of this Urdu word, Muhabad, Bekarar, and it sounds a little romantic. Yeah. Uh, so in, 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 in Manipuri, romantic, a little <laughs> archaic language will be many of the languages spoken by the Fascinating. tribals. <laughs> you, you see, that's, that's what you... Okay, Rame, would you like to add something? Uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, this we've seen everywhere in the mm -hmm. Northeast. Mm -hmm. You know, Maiti is, of course, slightly different. But if you look at the Nagas also, Naga is an umbrella term. It is. You yeah, know, it has multiple, multiple tribes. Strange. They didn't have the same language either. They did not. You know, so, uh, and this was obviously, as we know, a construct of the British, yes. you know. Yes. But uh, pre that, there was a lot of interaction. There was, see, what has happened is we sort of, because of the British policies and governance, methods that were brought in a lot of our original um, evolved self-evolved administrative uh, systems was set aside mm -hmm. a lot of the interactions that were historical were set aside like yes. I was reading one of the British archival uh, political officers books and he was saying how you know the one of the Naga tribes the house you know they used to go to uh, 
you know, give their taxes and, you know, sell their goods, uh, you know, near the kingdom of our home. And they used to come back wearing the fashionable hats that they used to wear, you know, the clothing, you yeah. know. So this sort of interaction was... Yeah. It's natural. Obviously. It's natural. If you're going to live side by side for hundreds of years, thousands of years, you're going to take, you're going to receive, you're going to give, and there's going to be this kind of interaction with respect to what your community, specific community needs mm -hmm. in terms of administrative systems, in terms of social systems um what we basically now see is you know a one fit all mm. with special references to the people who were considered or communities that were considered backward mm -hmm. by the british by the british you know so that is where this little disconnect in understanding history also comes you'll see and i'm sure uh, the professor will agree that uh, you know there's so much of conflict of history in manipur yeah that's nobody true. seems to you know because, agree yeah because uh, you know there has been this divide nobody wants to accept anything that came before that yes sir. and also wants to study ancient historical systems from today's lens from today's lens yes it makes it very problematic yes you know so as somebody who's been on the field who's done research one of my biggest problems was segregating uh, imaginary history to what we could really put together mm -hmm. and of course you know like i said civilizational connectivity history stories have their own place because a lot of the stories are um, oral mm -hmm. you know folklore has a lot of uh, importance in these areas but setting that aside there's still like i said a lot of uh, political motivations so histories also you'll see will come from that political motivation yeah, so one has to be very careful mm -hmm. in how you study it that's right there are a lot of you know intersections and connected connectedness so look at that i'll just give you one example we think that the first recorded one at least the vishnu uh, temple yes. comes from the east, not from the western side of Manipur. Mm -hmm. You know, Vishnupur or Visenpur, we call yeah, it, yes. is named after that. Yes. Uh, it's not an isolated place. Yes. Brahmin migrations have happened from, say, 15th, 16th centuries onwards. Uh, and uh, it, it could be a path of this Indic civilization and yes. Cynic civilization interaction. Manipur, to my mind, is unique in that sense. You know, I used to say this, and I still hold. If you ever think about this connection between Southeast Asia and uh, South Asia mm -hmm. of the two great civilization like Indic and the Cynic, mm -hmm. Manipur will give you an opportunity to look in this dynamics. Nowhere Correct. else in the, mm -hmm. of the country you will find this. Mm -hmm. And when I say this, particularly it is these people who are in the Oval Shape Valley, right. the Maitais, mm -hmm. you have this. The connections, the it's not only Chaitarul Kumbha, but there are corresponding records in Shan Correct. Chronicles mm -hmm. and, and Burmese Chronicles and mm -hmm. so on. This side, Ahom Chronicles. Mm -hmm. So people have been interacting uh, with each other. Yes. Uh, and, and some people get shocked when I said that, you know, you had a Ramayan and um, yes. uh, this Mahabharat were translated into Manipuris two centuries ago. Why is it shocking? Nobody would know this. Yeah. You, know, you see that kind of a thing. Mm. And then uh, if you look at Cambodia yes. and, and Thailand, and yes. there's so much, so much linkages from this side and that side. Yes. So, and that valley is, I, for me, in my community, is a very interesting community in that sense mm. to look at it. Mm -hmm. But not only there's larger connections, but with the uh, cognate tribes, the communities in and around the hill, mm -hmm. there is a deeper connection which they have started cutting it off cutting as if off. it is a yes. never connected kind of yes. thing. There are a lot of, I'm, I'm telling you, there are surnames in, in communities or, or families and clans within Maitais who, who are converted from quite clearly. Mm -hmm. Similarly, Maitais who move up the hills become tribal communities. Mm -hmm. This is recorded in their folklore. Yes, right. There are communities who can be traced back mm -hmm. among many of these hill communities. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't look at these interconnections, but rather isolated, opaque, bounded selves. Yes. And then as he said, it, many people have this political interest. Mm -hmm. So they would rather half on these divides rather than the connections. Yes, and it's very interesting what you said, the connections between Manipur and Southeast Asia. If you look at Manipuri classical dance, you can see the similarities between the Balinese dance, the Thai dance, the Cambodian Apsara dance. You can very clearly see the similarities. Since you tell me this, I'm, I'm just trying to make a documentary on 
By the way, I'm also into filmmaking. <laughs> okay, you are. I made feature film as well, a documentary. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to make a film on uh, a renowned filmmaker called Aribam Sham Sharma. Mm -hmm. He is a legend from okay. the Northeast. In fact, uh, the best hundred films in Indian history, mm -hmm. his film Imagining Them is included as one of them. Okay. In in the history of Indian cinema, mm -hmm. the top hundred. So he's one of them is Imagining Them. So I was talking to him. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ras Lila yes. is from the Panchadha, you know, if you see yeah. Bhagavatam yes. Sila, no? so Radha Krishna sort of things. Yes. But Rajasthan, UP, you have all these answers that you will see a difference in Manipuri classical dance, even if it is Ras Lila. Mm. There is a aesthetic sensibility which doesn't even fit into Natya Shastra. Mm. Yes. So that's a complicated and the dynamic nature of yes. things. Say for example, much of the Rasas mm. in Indian classical dances are through the facial expressions, the eye. And but there are no facial expressions in Manipuri dance. Manipuri may you cover it. Yes. So how do you emote? Body language. Uh, this emotion and rasa. Yes. So I was having a conversation. Then I realized is it from the Panchada, mm -hmm. uh, the union between Radha and Krishna mm -hmm. is at the plane of the spirit, mm -hmm. not the body. Yes. 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 You see, so the, 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 the romance between this thing at a spiritual plane mm -hmm. is not to be bounded by the body. Mm -hmm. So you are trying to s go beyond the body. Yes. Now, this text is in the Indic civilization, mm -hmm. but nobody in the rest of the country interpret in this form as a performance, mm -hmm. but it is the Manipuri Rasa which has actually interpreted this by devaluing the facial expressions. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yes. So, not only the similarity with the Balinese move and others, but, but the, even the uniqueness in which the Manipuris have interpreted a text which is not from Manipur, so to speak. Yeah. So in that sense, you can see a civilizational heritage yes. of a higher order. Oh, definitely. Uh, and, and how, that's why I said, if you ever think about act as policy or look as policy, mm -hmm. don't marginalize the matters, you know, they, mm -hmm. they are the embodiment of Absolutely. this mm -hmm. larger connection between the range of issues mm -hmm. and human capacity for innovations and, and interpretations, you know, this is something that it just struck me because you suddenly talk about Ras Leela. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so Ras Leela, Manipuri dance, all of that again comes from... Anyway, there was the first classical dances mm -hmm. among the five which was incorporated from the day one. Mm -hmm. uh, Maharaj Bhagyachandra was responsible. No, no, I'm saying that in, when India became independent, uh -huh. when we recognized well, five classical, classical dances, first Manipuri was one of them. It was offered in Shant Niketan. Former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi mm -hmm. opted for this. I've seen picture in Manipuri, Fanek and all. <laughs> she dancing Manipuri. Yes. So it has a long connection yes. with us. And that's why I said Manipuri speakers are found in UP centuries earlier. Mm -hmm. Is because, uh, especially Maitais, mm -hmm. Many of these the generation have changed now. I'm talking mm -hmm. about, I've seen my grandmother and other. You know what? They want to die. Where they want to die? Vrindavan? They don't want to die in Vrindavan or Navadev. Yes. That's their dream. Right. Yes. So there's a deeper connections with that one. And similarly, many of our cultural roots, many also look back this side. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the Burmese, the Thai sites, mm -hmm. you know, much similarities are there. And uh, so yes. if we ever think about India's connection with the Southeast Asia, and definitely the launching pet is Manipur, Manipur undoubtedly. Mm. And economy, you are saying we're doing well besides the cultural mm. part. But this crisis have uh, jeopardized but, some of these yeah. things. Yeah, but that has been definitely our soft power. Mm. And Northeast has been the root. So Act East is doing what we've done naturally. Yes. You know, for civilizations on end. We're trying to re kickstart that again. We are, what we are simply trying to do is kickstart that again. Yes. You know, so whether it's uh, uh, the export, the soft power of uh, re religious traditions or culture or, you know, language, you know. Uh, why would that not be the case? Yes. Now, if uh, so, I mentioned um, ancient civilizational connections also, if you were to look at, let's say, and here I'm not just talking about Manipur, but the rest of the region, if you were to look at the Mahabharat, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, there's a connection between the king of now, what is uh, in then what was called Assam or Kamrup or, Kamru. uh, you know, to uh, Harshvardhan's court. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, uh, sorry, uh, in Mahabharat, there's a connection uh, of Bhagdat being a part of the court of side. Okay, Bhagdat. Right. And he, uh, even the list of presents 
that he gave after the Kauravs lost the war, mm. he gave to the Pandavas is listed in the Udyog Parv okay. of the Mahabharata. Mm -hmm. So it's that detailed. Mm. In Harshvardhan's court, when um, Bhaskar Varman went, that's where he met Huan Sen mm. and he brought him back. Okay. You know, because Huan Sen was obviously, you know, the great Chinese uh, researcher was obviously very interested in uh, seeing what the frontier between India and China looked like at that point. Mm -hmm. So he was brought back. And at that time even, he described some of the uh, uh, knowledge that we have today is from his writings on the Northeast. He described him being as a Janoi Dhari king. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these kind of, uh, now whether you want to believe it, not believe it, that's a different thing. Yes. But has it been in our literature? Has it been in our ancient civilizational memory? Yes, it has. Mm. You know, the same way you mentioned uh, Rajshri Bhagya Chandra, which I've done an edited volume on. One of the most wonderful things, again, was uh, how bringing in Vaishnavism and the traditions of that with um, the indigenous faith and the merger didn't have any clash. No clash. You know, it <coughs> was a hybrid mm. that came up, <coughs> which created a higher culture. Yes. You know, so uh, for us to today believe that these things could not have happened or do not happen or, or, or did not happen is not, um, I don't think it's logical. Mm. You know, we mm -hmm. have to uh, begin with that acceptance that, you know, uh, these are changing, sort of evolving <coughs> ah, sorry. simply just the way the rest yeah. of India is. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of the examples that, uh, that, that strikes my mind is uh, Japan. It's a beautiful syncretism between Shinto and Buddhism. And elements of Hinduism. And elements of Hinduism. When I say Buddhism, I also mean Hinduism because it's for me, it's the same thing. Correct. People disagree, but that's fine. So the same thing you see between Sanamahism and Vaishnavism in Manipur, the same kind of thing. It's an interesting parallel that just, uh, struck me. So uh, we have spoken about Manipuri dance, the kings and all that. Clearly, the people we call the Metis today, they are the ones who are the historical originators of all this. Now, Manipur eventually had a downfall and the British came into the picture. This happened after the Burmese invasion, the Chahi Tarat Khuntakpa, right? The seven years of devastation. After 200th year of that, right in the middle of that. 200th year right now. Okay. It was 1819 to mm -hmm. 1826. Right. We are 23. So, right in the middle of the 200th year of that. So it's been 200 years since the beginning of Manipur's downfall. And then the British come into the picture and that's where the trouble starts. So could you perhaps uh, explain what happened? Well, uh, you know, uh, the British came into the picture. They helped, as you know, this recent history, you know, they helped the Burmese, uh, the Manipuri king mm -hmm. from the invading Burmese forces. Yes. Uh, eventually, they decided to make it a protectorate, yes. which typically turns into... You know, we know how it goes. Yeah, we know how that goes. Yes. You know, and uh, uh, that is when generally in all of the Northeast problems started, you know, yes. because uh, uh, there was this bifurcation uh, that started happening as to who were the tribes, who do we need to keep away, who are not the tribes, who is a non tribal. You know, these conversations came in. And if this is your question as to how did these problems happen. I mean, the, the settlement of outsiders into Manipur, southern Manipur, let's say. See, you know, now, uh, that of course, you know, one history says that, you know, there was a settlement uh, to use uh, people from Myanmar, uh, tribes from Myanmar as buffer. As a buffer. In these areas. Yes. Some will say that they were used, installed by the British mm -hmm. to prevent the raiding Naga tribes mm -hmm. from coming down, mm -hmm. you know, because again, like all these uh, 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 Naga tribes, a lot of uh, other tribes in the Northeast were very resistant to the British coming in. Therefore, there were resistant uh, uh, events like, uh, uh, you know, what Jadanong uh, uh, facilitated, you know, and um, these kind of uh, events were not rare. Mm -hmm. It happened throughout the Northeast where there were uprising, you know, yes. the Aki, Khamta, you know, all these uprisings were against the British control. Yes. Because neither did the British understand aspirations, but more importantly, like the professor pointed out earlier on, it was this difference between the civilized and the savages, you know, mm -hmm. so they saw all these communities as pagans mm -hmm. and we know how that went down in the Roman <laughs> Empire yes. and the same thing happened here you know so they decided to divide the tribes and divide what was called the valley people and yes. one of the problems with the British was cartography you know they never knew how to draw any maps any boundaries so it was randomly drawn if you look at the map of Africa you straight know lines. it's just like straight lines I'm and that is also true. tribal community that's how civil war start 
Correct. But yes. the same thing happened in the Northeast also. Yes. How can you divide on the basis of valleys and hills, you know? Yes. Uh, you divide through communities, but you also divide through resources like that, you know? And uh, that's what happened. Uh, 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 one of the examples is the Nagas, which, you know, ended up being the longest running separatist movement this country has ever seen. Yes. Then you bring in policies like the scheduled, uh, excluded, included uh, areas, you know, the scheduled areas, the ILR, inner line regulation. Uh -huh. You know, these were all policies that were brought in by the British to segregate areas that they didn't want any control over. Of course, they said that, uh, you know, this was uh, possibly because of um, non-interference. That's the excuse. That's the excuse. But the fact was alongside that they were holding expositions in Europe where they were caging mm -hmm. yes. native people yes. to justify colonization, yes. you know, and they were showing this off like animals in a zoo, yes. people, Europeans would come and see them and say, yes, you know, very sorry state of affairs, you must colonize them, you know. Yes. And uh, on one hand, they were trying to justify this. On one hand, they were excluding them. However, you know, we can keep also blaming the British for their policies. But have any of these policies changed? That's the question. After 1945, 1949, what changed? We continued the same policies. We continued the same policies. We continued looking at uh, communities as different communities, segregated communities, excluded communities. Um, you know, the ILR stayed on for many, many decades. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, in my opinion, unfortunately, in Manipur, it was recently established. re established The inner line permit. Yes. You know, uh, which I think has its own problems related to it. But in, uh, uh, you know, in tribal areas, you'll see there was unequal development. You know, and at one point, uh, the Indian National Congress also objected to this mm -hmm. um, because they said that there would be unequal uh, development, which would result in discontent at some point. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, you know, here we are, the rest of the valley people who've gotten more resources or have got more attention. Mm -hmm. And then the people who've been segregated on in the tribal areas who haven't had this sort of equal distribution. So that would result in some amount of discontent, which now we see in many pockets it has. Of yes. course, in the last decade or so, we've seen a tapering down of this sort of feeling of uh, separate separatism mm -hmm. but identity became cemented. Yes. And that also was then further cemented by the bringing in of umbrella identities which were based on new religious sort of uh, uh, movements. So yes. uh, there is one letter by uh, one of the political agents, one of the first political agents in the Northeast who wrote to the secretary and I, I quote this very often because it is so representative of how they wanted to govern us because they couldn't govern us on the basis of good governance. Mm, yes. So uh, he writes to the secretary of the government at that time, uh, who was sitting in London, saying that, you know, we're making a very big mistake. We are uh, trying to convert the middle classes and the upper middle classes, and therefore we are meeting with defeat. Mm -hmm. What we have found in the Northeast, and which was like Mackenzie said, our manifest destiny, mm -hmm. is we have found this bunch of pagans. We found these bunch of, uh, you know, uh, savages who are completely uncivilized, but who are also in a nascent stage of nationhood. Mm. So if we want, you know, this is where we should be having an impact. Therefore, either I'll pay for it or you send me money for missionaries. So uh, the secretary replied back saying, look, it'll be very, very difficult to win public favor on this mm -hmm. uh, because there was a certain section of society that was very against the sort of interference of the British in um, ancient societies, ancient civilizations, but also uh, in religious matters of other countries. Mm -hmm. So he said, no, we can't do that. Uh, what we are going to do, though, is we are going to send you money to establish schools. Okay. And you can choose to hire missionaries as educators. Okay. Uh, and of course, we also know with history, you know, some of the early <coughs> missionaries that came in uh, didn't find any acceptance whatsoever. It wasn't as if they walked in and they converted a community. It took a lot of time because to break these, you know, old ties, civilizational ties, these uh, ancient connectivities was not that easy, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, many missionaries came, went back. Also, these were very tough terrains. Eventually, when they established uh, their religion, um, they also realized the need to give common languages, common identities, umbrella terms, uh, so that 
they could control them. Yes. Now that is again a point of uh, something that we can owe to the British that created a point of conflict. Mm, yes, it is. You know, that we see mm. today. Yes. You know, you're not, uh, Nagaland wasn't asking for Nagaland as a separate state mm. uh, on the basis of ethnicity, but it was Nagaland for Christ. Christ, yes. You know, and that also caused because it was. Uh, you know, it was manipulated in such a way. Mm -hmm. And also there were international powers, the British never wanted to leave the Northeast. There was this idea that was never fulfilled about the Crown Colony, okay. you know, mm, which yes. was uh, uh, which was actually uh, something that they wanted to do. They wanted to keep all of these areas, uh, including Manipur, as a Crown Colony because exactly for the reason that we want to develop it today, that they saw areas like Manipur as the gateway to Southeast Asia, they saw these areas, these boundary areas as a counter to China. Mm -hmm. So you see all of these problems cemented themselves, created these found, uh, fault lines, created these boundaries, destroyed ancient systems, like I said before, of administrations, of how societies function. And within time, because we didn't pay attention as well, uh, it created a rift. Yes. You know, let me tell you, the largest uh, bulk of conversion hmm. happened post-independence. Right, indeed. During the Nehruvian era. In, in the Northeast. Yes. You know, and we uh, forgot to uh, appreciate or even pay attention to great sociologists like Guria and all, as opposed to Verrier Elvin, uh, in terms of he had a very concrete idea for uh, what we call tribal communities, you know, and he was very against this sort of uh, uh, ex exclusion, you know. He said, on the contrary, they should be reintroduced. He never said introduced, reintroduced, mm -hmm. you know, to the communities that they live side by side with, to communities in the rest of the country, mm -hmm. uh, because that is what will create uh, national integration as we have had before. Mm -hmm. But obviously, Elvin was of a different point of view where he said no these are unique uh, uh, you know populations and we must keep them separate mm -hmm. you know so therefore post independence also we followed not just um, policies brought in by the British or uh, uh, you know rules and regulations but also sociologically anthropologically how we saw these societies that finally is now something that I feel we are having to deal with. Yes, we are having to deal with that today. Right. See, so, I just, yes. the one, you know, I just wanted to revisit what you said before we go to the post-colonial and that the British engagement, you can see, they made a lot of uh, mistakes, both in terms of applying what their European experience into this part of the world, mm -hmm. but also within the country, what they have used in the rest of the country, they tend to replicate there without realizing the specificity of the area. Yes. Uh, of course, there are, uh, you know, uh, glimpses of contradictions and, and sometimes even an effort mm -hmm. to say, for example, a linguistic survey. Mm -hmm. They thought that Manipur could be placed not as a part of the uh, South Asian linguistic survey, but rather as a part of the South Asian part. So they could recognize that these communities are in a unique position of neither this one, neither that one, but has a uh, signatures of many of these things. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't, I, my example of Rasila was to give you that there is an essence of the people yes, there. Yes. How a Panchadha interpretation is performatively interpreted back in Manipur, not in the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. So that shows the essence of the people. And similarly, the cynic civilization doesn't mean it's a passive kind of a receiver. There is an active essence of integrating, inventing, reinterpreting. That is the site. Now, and Manipur, I find it as a unique in that sense. Many of these glimpses. Right. Some people take it very easy way out of saying, as the imprint of the Chinese, as the imprint of the Indic. It's not right. like this. Mm. So there is that uniqueness of that one. So right. they made a mistake, according to me, first by putting my European categories into this part of the world, yes. and sometimes the rest of the country here. So one classic mistake they made in Manipur is the way they've understood um, Assam. Mm -hmm. See, when the, uh, Ahoms uh, and, and this Brahmaputra Valley uh, base stayed, uh, it was the, uh, the British who brought in uh, these Naga Hills mm -hmm. and Lusai Hills, all of them. Yeah. 
But there is a distinction between these two. Mm -hmm. Because see, many of the, in Manipur, look at the Manipur army, you have this conscript from the valley, the oval shape. When I say valley, please do understand as the oval shape. I'm not talking about the other valleys hmm. uh, in Manipur. So you have conscript among the uh, hill people as well. Right. And one of the classic display of that is a meeting between Lord Northbrook and Chandrakirti Maharaj. Okay. When his entourage has in the front, these people from the hills on yes. one flank, followed by the uh, infantry of the drawn from the valley, mm -hmm. then the cavalry, then at the end you have these elephants and others. It's like a pyramid. Okay. It's, it's a ritual enactment of his state, mm -hmm. and that was in full display when he met uh, Lord Northbrook. Okay. The first meeting between the British Viceroy and a uh, ruler of Manipur. Okay. okay. Uh, so. Many of these relationships and, and state formation, mm -hmm. there is a difference between Assam and Manipur. Right. In Assam, uh, that kind of a ritual sovereign power or the political power is not much noticeable as compared to what you see in Manipur. Mm, right. So there is an organic, not only in terms of geography, but also in terms of political evolution. Mm. So when you separate the Naga Hills from Assam mm. or the Lusai Hill as Mizoram, mm. uh, it doesn't have much of an issue at one level, precisely because they were not that organic in their relationship. Okay. And geologically or geographically, if you see it, uh, Brahmaputra Valley is barely 50 meters above the mean sea level. Yes. And the Naga Hills, Kohima is 1450 around that one. Mm. It's almost like 30 times higher. Yes. And if you look at the geological formation, they come from Brahmaputra Valley is actually an extension of Indo Gangetic Plain. Mm. Yes. Because it's open on one end. And, and when the collision happened, I, I, I look at geological theory, there was a pressing on the eastern side. Uh -huh. That's why they said the uh, ranges of Himalayas are higher on the eastern side than the northern, you know, Kashmiri side and so on. Right. So, what I'm saying is that the relationship between Kohima and Guwahati or the Brahmaputra Valley and the Naga Hills is between that plain and the mountain. Mm. But the relationship between Imphal or Churachampur or Urkhul is not the same. It's yes. because part of the same mountainous region. Yes. Even today, as in a fact speaks for itself, so you have Imphal is 790 meters above the sea level. Mm -hmm. Churanchampur is barely 920. So it's a difference of 130. Yes. And I was told that the highest building is in your place in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. In building is 320 meters high. Mm -hmm. So if you, you consider, uh, I was talking to Karan Thapar in his program and he himself gave me this. It's almost like saying, so it came to him also as a surprise. Okay. So he thought that this is a you know, mountain no. and he said <laughs> Churan Champur is actually a valley that means and he says yes. it's like empire building me. You are saying that the ground floor is the valley and the top floor. You want yes. to separate the building will collapse. Yes. So I think the Manipur, if you see, I'll also share with you a geographical mm -hmm. organic. And I have looked at into this political geography very carefully. Uh, East Pakistan and uh, West Pakistan couldn't survive. Mm -hmm. Because of the geography, there is a geographical factor in the political entity. Yes. So I realized that Manipur survived for one reason. Because the geography itself is an organically connected. Mm -hmm. So if you see all the major rivers in Nagalin, mm -hmm. it runs from southeast towards the northwest. Okay. The same thing applies in Mizoram. Okay. But if you look in Manipur, all the major river fall from the northwestern or the northern side to the southern side or southern side. I see. So the hill and that formation is that organically connected. Mm. So an erosion of something in the hill areas, environmental, that's what you're facing. Floods and in, in Manipur mm. and the landslides in, in the hills. Deforestation is a big problem. Deforestation. Beyond your identity yeah. politics mm. it is going people are going to suffer in the yes. days to come yes. so there is an organicity in terms of the geography right so when the political power of this state expanded beyond this geography they couldn't sustain it okay. I, I mean i looked at it for example their power went all the way the other side of the chindwin river yeah. mm. and on this side and the Kachar was under the domination mm. but they couldn't sustain that yes because it is not supported by the 
geographical no character of that land. But all this higher hill, say Tengnopal is a Manipuri word. Pal means bunker, mm -hmm. stockade. So it's a military. So Palil is the base came. Okay. Then you go up the highest range is Tengnopal. Mm -hmm. Then you climb down, then the Moray comes at the base okay. of that one. So mm -hmm. it's a supported geographically. So mm -hmm. that's when see, I'm saying, when my, my feeling is that it is geographically sustained, people are so deeply interconnected. Yes. And if you, you've been to Imphal, next time, just be cautious. Look at the aircraft. I try to take it from my mobile phone. I have seen this, mm -hmm. but people are talking about it. So I thought that I'd, I could do it properly because of my location in the aircraft. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the muscles and the veins, mm -hmm. the hill runs through the valley like this. Mm -hmm. If you separate, you tear it apart, yeah. mm -hmm. it's going to be bloody. Yes. Metaphorically, as well as Figured. literally. literally. Yes. And I remember Ashish Nandi's uh, remark when I talk, because I work on partition with under his project for a long time, for almost nine years. What I learned is, closer you are and you try to separate, bloodier it will be. Yes, right. So he said his favorite example is we must remember that the greatest war fought in Indian mythology is not between strangers but between two first cousins. Yes, right. And also the closer you Great are. Uh, yes. So I mean he said this often. Mm -hmm. So I get the feeling this geographically speaking yes. as well. You just look at the flight when it lands down in fall. Yes. And it's funny, these hills are right in the, middle. in the middle, this side is another valley, this side and it is taper, then another valley. Yes. But I don't know why these places have been kept as a part of the Kangpokwe district. Mm. And all the people, I'll give you next time you visit Thawal, there's a place, there's a college there, Thawal College. Mm. Right next to the college is a hill, okay. which is part of Kangpokwe district. But all the villages there, they live, their marketing is done in Thawal Bazaar, <laughs> school college in that bazaar, <laughs> this, um, hospital is in that. But for their official work, they have to travel via Imphal all the way to Kangpokwe. Does no it sense. make sense? No, makes no sense. But you know, this is mm. the, the falsity that has sustained us. Mm. And this is what the British have started. Yes. And then what I, she has already said, unfortunately, the post-colonial Indian state and its rulers have continued the same. In fact, aggravated the more. Yes. British did not separate the land. Hmm. But it is the uh, land revenue and reform. 60, 1960. 1960 yes. Which has introduced this hill area. Mm, yes. In a state, mm. which is planning commission also termed it as a hill state. Yes. And in geologically, geographically, a mountainous region. Mm -hmm. So, hill state, and you are saying that hill area, as the valley is not part of that mountainous terrain. Mm -hmm. so it makes no sense. So, planning commission has already classified it as a hill state. Right. The National Development Council, they form a committee in 1965. Mm -hmm. So, they have developed some criteria of how to do uh, development for the hill, re hill areas in the country, mm -hmm. not about Northeast. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they have listed two groups of states. Mm -hmm. So one they call it hill state. Then another is state with hill areas. Okay. So Madhya Pradesh, Bihar, Rajasthan, Maharashtra, all of them, including Assam, mm -hmm. is called state with hill areas. Kerala and all of them were. Okay. And they are listed another group called hill states. Usme kya kya? Kashmir, mm -hmm. Uttarakhand, Himachal, Sikkim, Arunachal. You know, Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, all this, which is essentially the Himalayan yeah. yes, part. Yeah. But you are introducing hill areas mm. in essentially a hill state. Yes. And that irony is something that many people don't realize. Right. Yes. And second part, I must tell you how this conflict is sustained and created. In the rest of the country, you have a scheduled tribe. Mm. It's a population-based category, mm -hmm. scheduled tribe advisory councils. You know, the elected members from the scheduled tribes, you know, they are member of that one. Mm -hmm. In Article 2, 44, 1, uh, for the rest of the country, but excluding Assam. Mm -hmm. But Assam has a, their own ag, scheduled tribe advisory council in 19, uh, 1967. Okay. 
You know what is the term they use in Manipur? It's not scheduled tribe. Mm -hmm. It's a hill area committee. Hill area committee. Yeah, HSC. It's on the land. Mm -hmm. It is nowhere in the rest of the country. You see this. Mm -hmm. And that too in a hill state. Mm -hmm. The irony is that many, uh, the, the government of India's uh, order 1972, uh, we laid out this creation of the Hill Area Committee, which I call it a mini assembly within the assembly. Mm -hmm. So the bifurcation and division has been sustained and created by the British and the post colonial state instead of reversing. Yes. I've said, you know, Prime Minister Modi talks about decolonization. Mm -hmm. I think it's high time to we decolonize these categories. Right, yes. Absolutely. This is a hill state, mm. Government of India's Planning Commission, and you're calling it a hill area committee, mm. and which also give a legislative. So you're not taking care of the scheduled tribe population, because mm. scheduled tribe population are also in the other uh, okay. assembly. Yes, sir. You know, this, this irony, this contradiction comes in, in the Government of India's Order 1972 itself, mm. because it says hill area committee will have member of the assembly whose constituency is wholly or partially have hill areas okay so in that sense you know this government tried to include some of the metas okay MLA because their constituency has it uh -huh. but they made a mistake it should have come from the union government article 371 it's not the state government who should do that uh -huh. so these are the ironies mm -hmm. so because of this irrational administrative so this hill near this Example I gave you, here is the valley. Mm -hmm. You make a this valley ka district policy, you make a road. This is another district, you don't take care of it. Mm. So there's a, the developmental lacuna is there. Mm. So I just wanted to flag off these issues. These mm. are some of the things we don't understand. And Remy, I must tell you, it's not only about the mainstream. It's about the people there in that state themselves. We're not aware, only you are reminded they couldn't figure it out. Ha, huh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. How come this piece of hill is incorporated in that district there? Mm -hmm. But it is, everything is done here. Mm -hmm. So like this, there's a, uh, we, we need to rationalize this. And the last one I just wanted to make about development issues that he make it. I, I think this present government is trying to do something like bottom up planning strategies, mm -hmm. topographically sensitive planning. The earlier planning has a weakness in terms of a top-down model. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't fit in. Mm -hmm. And I check it in Prime Minister's yours now, even you have something like uh, 250, uh, you know, population. If a village doesn't have it, mm -hmm. under that yours now, you can't have a metal road there. Okay. Now, what happened is many of these villages, mm -hmm. you have 20 households, mm -hmm. 50 households, how they are going to get connected, under which policies. Mm -hmm. So thankfully, I think Taming Long is part of uh, selected districts in across the country mm -hmm. under these new government policies. They are trying it a uh, local specific design, bottom up planning to see the development. So much of the so-called development discourse, especially in Manipur, I have checked uh, in some of the studies has to do with the terrain also, mm -hmm. with the law and order situation. Mm -hmm. You remember that Manipur Hills have been the theater of armed conflict for yes. more than 50 years, yes. which required Indian Army to be involved. Yes. So how do you have a development process in that? And then such kind of demography, thinner population spread out in a large area. So there are objective factors, but unfortunately what I think is things have been communalized. You keep on blaming Maitais. Mm -hmm. and. I've been saying, if there is a genuine differential development, why don't we have an objective assessment and try to correct it, mm -hmm. rather than communalize and blaming the maitais and valleys and so on. I mean, if you're genuinely concerned and development, then you ought to be doing this. Uh, that's my feeling, you know, rather than succumbing to this identity politics. You take care of this one, and it is good for everybody else. Instead of communalizing, there are a topographical factors, there are a demographic issues, there are flows in the planning model, especially in the earlier models. Then you have low and order, and above all, you have a new patrimonial structures. Everybody thinks that land or state property belongs to. We have a political class, and they hang around. Mm -hmm. They treat this public property as their personal uh -huh. things. So percentage, uh, rampant institutionalized corruption, which cuts across communities. Mm. Instead of looking at that, why the hell you created this problem? Mm. In, I think for the rest of the country, if you think that Manipur is the hub to connect it 
for development, also a model state. This inability to have an objective discourse is hampering that national interest. Mm -hmm. I think that is something that this crisis tells me very clearly. Instead of flexing muscles and, right. you know, mm. I don't know. But popular, she must have faced it because she is on TV. You know, we don't have hospital, we don't have this, we don't have that. I said, please try to have an objective assessment of that one rather than communal as I am. Uh, you know, and mm. uh, I think that I, if there is a genuine underdevelopment, do I get benefit by perpetuating that one? You don't, clearly. I don't. Yeah. So, before we come to the genesis of this conflict, the what we are seeing right now, let's talk about the policies a little bit more after 1947-1949. Manipur was integrated in, into India in 1949. That's, that's also a often popular discourse. Actually, uh, an instrument of accession was signed yeah. in 47. Okay, but it officially became part of the Union of India in 49. Accession was okay. done. That's a mistake. Merger is a different one. Okay, merger was 49. Accession the was 47. Accession. Kashmir is part of India through an instrument of accession, yes, not correct. through Mazar. Uh -huh. So, Manipur instrument of accession was in 1947. Okay. The merger is taking over the administration of the set. Okay. Whatever, what Indian political science would call it, internal autonomy or sovereignty, hmm. uh, was destroyed okay. in 1947. Manipur had a constitution of its own for a couple of years. Predates the. Yes. In fact, you look at in the schedule one of the Indian constitution, entry number 19, how Manipur is defined. Uh -huh. In the Indian constitution itself. Mm -hmm. You know how, how is it defined? I mean, have you come across this? No, do tell me. In the Indian constitution schedule, the entry of the states, mm -hmm. it says Manipur, and definition, this is 19, huh? it says, is the territory which used to be administered as if it were a chief commissioner's province. Mm -hmm. Before the commencement of this constitution, okay. under the name Manipur. Okay. That's a definition. Mm -hmm. That clearly tells you that Indian constitution itself is telling you that this territory existed as a geopolitical entity before the adoption of the Indian constitution. Right. Okay. So that, that is the history. That, so you then take back when it became a part of uh, a chief commissioner's province. Uh -huh. That's the merger agreement. Okay. On 15 October when that agreement was implemented, uh -huh. government of India issued putting a chief commissioner to govern that one. Mm -hmm. There are other areas like Delhi, which was governed by a chief commissioner. Okay. So when the constitution was adopted, those chief commissioner's province were put as the uh, Parsi states. Okay. So Manipur was one of them. So if you go back here from the Indian constitution, the chief commissioner was that 15 October 1949. Okay. But Manipur had an assembly hmm. uh, based on the Manipur constitution of 1947. Hmm. The people will say that, why did you have this constitution while the nation was already making a constitution? But you should remember that that period, the first effort to integrate the princely states were through the instrument of accession. Yes. And they only have these three powers actually, taken over by the federal government. Mm -hmm. I'm using this word, uh, trying to be more true to the documents. Oh. Under the Government of India Act 1935, this instrument of accession was derived from there. Mm -hmm. So in that one, it is called the Federation of India. Okay. Article, uh, Government of India Act 1935. Mm -hmm. Today in our constitution, we write uh, India, that is Bharat, yes. shall be a union of states. Uh -huh. In the first article of uh, Government of India Act 1935, it is the Federation of India. Okay. So princely states were supposed to form the second chamber, mm -hmm. then it could not implement it. So in 37, that constitution was partially implemented because of that one. But remember that instrument accession was derived from that Government of India Act 1937. Right, so it was signed in 47. Mm -hmm. But it, according to that scheme in the 35, these states have fair share of autonomy. Mm -hmm. So they can have their own constitution, their own government and so on. So the Manipur had that government and constitution based on that one. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's where the controversial merger is because that instrument of accession does not deny that constitution and so on was dissolved. But it was not ratified. Even the Supreme Court has taken note of that one. In one case, if I remember, is 1955 judgment. Mm -hmm. Whether those documents are valid, the Supreme Court says it's valid. Mm -hmm. So it was dissolved. 
Okay. That's the unfortunate part of the uh, post-colonial history of Manipur. A mm -hmm. lot of Indian scholars like B.K. Roy Berman said the manner in which the merger was carried out was less than desirable. Okay. Mm -hmm. It should have been much more because there were forces which wanted to merge with Indian Union within the state. They were opposing to that. Yeah. But overall, that has already an imagination. That's why in Maharaja's own speech, inaugural speech in the assembly, he says, just as sun rises in the east, for India, democracy rises in Manipur. So he has already made that kind of a comment there. Mm -hmm. So that's why B.K. Roy Berman says it's less than desirable. It should have been more sensitive. Much of the problem in Manipur is, to me, uh, my way of looking has something to do with that one. Okay. Had it been done properly, if, if not that kind of a uh, muscle flexion, I don't think insurgency would have come up in Manipur. That's my clear picture. Uh, because of the pan-Indian nationalist images are already there. Um, but, but that alienation has started. And since I'm talking, I must mention that G.K. Pillai, former Union Home Secretary, mm -hmm. he said too, Manipur's, uh, Manipur issue, unlike Nagaland and others, is easier to handle. We have humiliated Manipur quite a lot in our history. Mm -hmm. You know, they fought for the inclusion of Manipur language to be included in the Indian constitutions. Uh -huh. You know, and then they fought for statehood, a state which had an assembly of its own. And you have created a state out of a hill district called Nagaland, hmm. insulting the people who have been demanding with the Gandhi, K, peaceful Satyagraha and all of them. Yes. But you don't, you keep on denying them. And Nagaland was created from nowhere because of the armed group. Hmm. So it's like paying the... That's how it goes. If you, if you stand up in arms, you're going to get That's a reward for that. part. Yes. And my feeling is this time, mm. and this is I'm speaking the current connection, the lesson that we must learn, you should not give prize to violence. Yes, absolutely. If people think that you flex your muscle to violence and create an autonomy or something of mm. that kind, I think government of India will be making a second time mistake. Yes. So I want to talk about the genesis of the issue. So firstly, I would like to ask you, why was there an insurgency in every state in the Northeast India after independence? Every state erupted in insurgencies and uh, separatist movements. That's number one. And secondly, what's the when did the cookies first start appearing in Manipur? I mean, if you look at 1850, I don't think there were, there were hard. There must have been hardly a handful of cookies. The people who we identify as cookies today. So today there are a significant population. So how did this happen? Um, so let me uh, start by saying that uh, what Professor said right now, I quite agree with it. You know, you have these hill councils, you know, uh, who don't know the kind of powers that are vested in them. Mm. You know, this is, uh, they function like states within states because they have the powers to do so, mm. you know. So they have powers like, uh, you know, uh, they can overlook their family matters, you know, uh, uh, education, health care. I think, sir, everything except financial bills mm. go directly to them. Yeah, you know, so they do have quite a bit of power to mm. self-determine. Mm. Um, but like he pointed out, it's not just about the mainstream. It's about the populations within these states who don't understand uh, certain types of... Um, uh, they don't understand history or they don't understand uh, uh, processes or they don't understand the powers that are vested in them. Also, the other problem is obviously a lot of tribes are not just, it's not just one tribe. <coughs> you know, like when you say cookies also, <coughs> there are a number of tribes, you know. So the people who are in these hill councils may not uh, over and above really see eye to eye <coughs> to other either. Just because it's called hill uh, councils which are made up of hill tribes doesn't mean that you know, there's agreement between them. Yeah. There isn't. Therefore, there was the Kuki Paiti uh, great uh, conflict as well. There mm. was the Kuki Naga conflict yes. as well. You know, yeah. these are inter-tribal conflicts. So, first of all, I think we need to understand that there are <coughs> seed issues. Mm -hmm. Number two, I take his <coughs> point that this is not just about the mainstream. This is about our populations within these communities not knowing what powers they have, what, you know, how they can really use it. If they're talking about development, then you already have processes in place to self-determine what sort of development you would aspire for and want and how do you get to there. But of course, there's rampant uh, corruption yes. and there's, uh, yes. you know, every, I find, I find <coughs> in the East, each person is possibly more political hmm. than a whole community of people in uh, Delhi, you know. Hmm. Uh, so all these uh, have obviously now uh, 
prolonged, you know, that emotional process have prolonged into this sort of conflict. But um, if you ask me the genesis of the conflict, I would say that this is, these are legacy issues. They've been having these skirmishes been, have been having uh, taken place for a very long time. Um, it isn't just one thing that has come up. Unfortunately, what has also happened is um, that we have seen low intensity sort of disturbances and conflicts for a while. Before this also came up, you know, things were happening before it that we could tell that there was friction. And apart from it being a historical friction in the recent uh, past also, that has been left a little bit unnoticed. Yeah, you know, yes. Or, uh, uh, you know, uh, it hasn't been mitigated in a way. Um, and that obviously resulted in the scheduled tribe inclusion debate, which I find completely irrational. <coughs> and like I said uh, to you before we started this interview, I'm neither a Kuki, I'm not a Naga, I'm not a Maiti. What appeals to me is you know, what is rational. I have no, uh, I have no game in this, so as to say. So, uh, if we look at the scheduled tribe inclusion, what was it? It was a comment by the High Court. It was not even a comment. It was a suggestion to the state government. The And anybody who is a part of any tribal community or not, or who has studied, uh, it, uh, you know, tribal politics or communities will know that the High Court independently cannot give you that status. Can the state government independently give you that status? No. What is the process? You know, there's a very long process for any sort of inclusion in the scheduled tribe list. You have to, it will go through many different levels of um, sort of, uh, you know, looking into. So you'll have the NCST that will be involved. You'll have the TRI that will be involved. You'll have other agencies that will be involved to see the veracity of this claim. And then eventually, you know, if they uh, agree, you know, the government, and the president involved will have to include them in the scheduled tribe list, which then can be contested. You know, so one of the prime examples is of the Lombardas mm -hmm. down south, mm -hmm. you know, who Indira Gandhi decided to uh, include um, because um, they were a, a formidable voting group. Okay. Right. Yes. And uh, that has been contested now for over 20 years. Okay. So to be included in a scheduled tribe list is not that easy. Mm -hmm. So the uh, what what really sort of flummoxes me is the fact that just on a recommendation, you know, it could rile up the kind of tempers that it Maybe it was just an excuse to go to arms, you know, take a bath. You said it, I didn't. <laughs> no. I so, said it's, also, it's, it's almost like a pretext. It's exactly. Like a pretext. If the context, context of AST so the is true, is then the rest of the... Uh, why you don't get burned in other places where the scheduled tribe right? Ukru. Mm -hmm. Taming long. Mm. These are all tribal areas. But you know, why are the Nagas not objecting? That's very curious. Why are the cookies only objecting? So, this, you know, these no, that's, kind of that's why he said it's an excuse. Yeah, so these that's kind of dynamics to me become then very interesting because then I weigh which side, you know, or what argument is rational and therefore what is not. Yes. Now, uh, even if you look at this entire, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, possessiveness about only we can be scheduled tribes. Yes. Let me tell you, according to what is it, the 1975 local committee report, it gives the characteristics of what a tribe should be. Hmm. You know, some of the character, and I think there are five main characteristics. Some of them is uh, uh, uniqueness of culture, mm -hmm. but then some is shyness of contact. Shyness of contact, okay. Also, yeah, isolated communities. Isolated, isolated communities, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, different practices, the, you know. Well, if you actually apply those criteria, they don't apply to the Kokis or the Nagas. They don't apply to a, most of the tribal in communities. In fact, this government has already tried to correct this. I don't know whether you are aware of this. In 2014, the, this government has already formed a committee headed by the Tribal Welfare Secretary. Mm. They have asked to remove some of these. I think we are using outdated uh, methods. Yes, exactly. They said it's pejorative you know, and outdated terms like primitive tree. Correct. I mean, uh, they now, said, you know, you shouldn't do that. If it would apply, it would apply to now, let's say. The sentinel is straight. Yeah, the sent exactly, yeah. my point. I do, by the way, sorry for interrupting. I like, uh, for first time I'm hearing this. Your yeah, observation, now is it you said something. What is that? About if those criteria were actually used, many of these tribals yeah, would not many fit. Many of those yes, tribals yeah. wouldn't fit. <laughs> That's yes. I, the, I know this is interesting the, that way you make it that point. The problem <laughs> is that uh, e even if we want to change, you know, like uh, Sir says, you know, that uh, there's been uh, an appeal to change what the characteristics should be, mm -hmm. it's sad 
because you know developed tribes you still cannot take away their scheduled tribe status mm -hmm. right Absolutely. so you have to change the characteristics mm. so then what is a tribe you know so therefore my point is that even the cookies will not apply in that characteristics mm. right they they you know so on what basis do you object if another community wants to be included now it is the maithi's fundamental right to demand yes you know and that demand you can object you can dissent you know but that cannot turn into anarchy yeah you know there is a big difference in that so here with the genesis of this problem i find the foundation of it very very flimsy i don't think um, you know this who's a tribe who's not a tribe can be determined by another tribe yes. that doesn't fulfill the criteria in the first place yes that's right you know mm. number 2 um i don't think any sort of objection can be uh, the response can be this mm -hmm. yes you know you lose public support but also you lose the war of rationality yes because look where it's led mm -hmm. the whole state mm -hmm. and honestly number 3 um we need to look at whether the maithis were uh, considered tribes or not whether they consider themselves tribes or not mm -hmm. and pre british Uh, uh pre uh, uh in the british era mm. there are many many uh, uh, inclusions of the manipuris as forest tribes mm. as uh, uh, tribal communities mm. of the maithis also specifically mm -hmm. where the word maithi has been used apart from using the manipuri okay. word mm. it's happened multiple times right. you know so so there's a president yeah so uh, that is your point of reference mm. you know so where what is the logical argument then to object to this yes you know you look at meghalaya meghalaya is uh, you know equally the same they mm. have all have the same rights yes you know so a, sm a small community like the maithis and uh, like we've all agreed and you know also discussed this that you know there's again uh, the debate of minority majority also doesn't stand here yes you know so the foundation the genesis of this conflict it, that is what you're asking me i think is very flimsy mm. and the reasons can be many mm. The second thing that you asked me is about the cookies. Mm. You know, where did, you know where did they come from? How is the population change? Mm. And the population definitely has changed. Oh, it has. See, from 2011 we haven't had a census. Yes. And I think when that census happens, it's going to open lots of it eyes. It would open a lot of eyes. You know, I also think and so please feel free to correct me that um, you know, a lot of the inclusion in the census is not based on subtribes. you know they'll come under cookies yeah um, they'll come yes. under um, nagas yes. yes you know that also sort of amalgamates mm. the population yes number 3 we cannot deny illegal infiltration we cannot right because uh, if every other state has it in the northeast and the reason i'm pointing this out is because i've had a lot of people tell me that there is no illegal infiltration <laughs> in manipur okay you know my point always is that you must be then an extremely special case because you know there's evidence of illegal I infiltration in every other state yes. you know so that has also played a major role mm. and that has obviously changed the demographics of the state yes you know uh, many a times uh, you would have heard it also people would talk about churchandpur mm -hmm. you know the population in churchandpur in the last 30 years has like trebled mm. you know from 60000 what is it now 6 lakhs you know it's 10 times yeah you mm. know so um a lot of people have uh, the counter argument to that is its internal migration uh -huh. you know but uh, that is a little difficult statistically really to uh, logically prove you know mm. uh, so we have to accept that there's illegal infiltration one of the uh, one of the low intensity conflicts that also happened and there was a chain of them before uh, the may 3rd uh, conflict started was Uh, precisely because of this mm -hmm. a lot of settlements had been removed mm -hmm. of illegal immigrants on forest land okay forest, forest land doesn't even that doesn't even mean that that's manipur mm. land you know that's that central land central land yes. right there was illegal immigration that had settled in these lands yes. and the state had made an attempt to remove a lot of these settlements yes of course uh, the counter argument to that is there was no dialogue mm -hmm. you know but this over emphasis on dialogue mm. 
you know dialogue is just a way of pushing kicking the can down the road there are times when dialogue is necessary yes there are times when uh, you know uh, within the country with your citizens you need to open channels of communication yes but i don't think that becomes really a necessity when there is illegal infiltration that yeah. is indulging in illegal activity activities now if you remember right down the conflict the manipur uh, manmari's government had taken out a notice which clearly stated yes. that any manmari's nationals living in manipur or other states in india illegally should be careful of indulging in any illegal activity like poppy cultivation yes poppy cultivation they should also be very careful in not instigating communal violence yes now the neighboring government is saying this from where the infiltration is coming in mm -hmm. and we are not willing to accept that there is a legal infiltration yes yes you know so the, this sort of set of logic makes me makes me doubt the motive mm. of the people arguing for this narrative mm -hmm. you know because what is your motive uh, i mean how can you be blind you know how how can you be blind to the fact that these these things are happening 40000 refugees have been registered in mizoram officially officially yes unofficially to who knows you think that manipur there won't be any you know was also contiguous with chin state they were all contiguous yes. all these tribes are contiguous you mm. know uh, uh, there was a, a point where under zone nationalism mm. there were protests also uh, that was carried out against the myanmar's uh, uh, military junta mm. you know so all these dynamics have you know definitely come to play in uh, manipur mm. and uh, you know i think one has to start a conversation if it has to be rational with the acceptance of these facts mm. you know you cannot deny these facts and then want to come to a conclusion or a consensus or a dialogue yes right right so we cannot deny that there's been a lot of illegal in infiltration into manipur into mizoram as well now let's talk about the poppy angle what's the poppy angle what is the the poppy angle poppy cultivation well pop no before that i just wanted to i am glad that remy has raised his mm -hmm. uh, issue uh, there are uh, first thing you know you started about the uh, you know uh, in in 1840s how they the british plant them and so on yeah bring the cookies. documents about the migration pattern especially of these tribes but uh -huh. i must clarify here okay. i have been taking these positions if somebody has migrated say 100 years ago or or, or 200 years ago mm -hmm. for me they are my fellow citizens Correct. they have been part and parcel of our life mm -hmm. but this should not be confused with uh the idea of illegal mm -hmm. immigrations the denial of it which is what has been happening mm -hmm. and i try to understand why they are denying that as you rightly pointed out if in mizoram they are already have an officially and yes. remy is rightly pointing out we don't know what is an official figure is mm -hmm. like but if it is 40000 there and you can't say that there is none or a couple of thousand they are saying it two three facts will put a question mark on this line of argument mm. the number of kuki villages official record mm -hmm. is drastically increased mm -hmm. in comparison to those belonging to other tribes which come under nagas yes why is that why is that oh, why is that where the the tribes which came come under naga conglomeration used to have more emeles than the this group okay. called cookies before mm -hmm. but now neck and neck with 100 uh, 10 10 and look at places like kangpokpi the the number of villages and which community they belong to these mm -hmm. are facts yes anybody beyond propagandist work yes. please go and check it yes anybody i used to say sometimes if you doubt somebody's religion mm. then please send a uh, christian uh, you know american native Mm. if you think that they can speak the truth mm -hmm. please send them and check it whether the number of villages increases force or not mm. that these these villages have increased and so on yes or if you believe that the hindu or uh, you know mainstream will tell you the truth mm. please send them there mm. what i'm saying is a check the facts yes. correct so there is an increase in the number of villages as a significant, uh, significant completely it? contradictory to the yes. other patterns of the villages of the other communities yes and so therefore these two facts that we have to start with you know if in mizoram you have this 
why not in Manipur? Yes. And then you have uh, these villages increasing is, is a fact. But why are the villages only increasing in Manipur, not in Mizoram? No, the, Southern uh, that, no, no, that's what I'm trying to say something on this. The three facts, let's keep it. Yeah, because a lot of propaganda has been going on. Yes. Immediately, if I say I'm a Maitre, so people will cast an person, mm -hmm. And for Remy also, they will use X, Y, Z factors to yeah. cast. So I'm saying that, say in whichever religious group, yes. Hindu or Muslims, or if you don't trust anybody, um, any Maitre, I say send a native Christian American mm -hmm. to check whether these facts are true or not. Yes. Reasonable thing is, in Mizoram, you have 40 officially at least. Do you think that Manipur mein nahi hoga? Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's not, not possible. possible. The increase in the disproportionate or significant increase in the number of villages in comparison to the other communities, why is it so? Yes. Is you can check it. And then change in the uh, you know number of MLAs, mm. why there is a shift, yes, clear. why certain constituency has become so and so rather than the other communities. Yes. Please check these facts and let's figure it out. Now there is subtle thing which I have discovered in the last two months. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, this is not new. There is a porous border, yes. so people come in. Yeah. But unlike Mizoram, in Manipur, there is two specific facts which I want to mention. Okay. Number one is this. There is a demographic politics, which I call it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Compa competing among the scheduled tribes themselves. Mm -hmm. So because in the delimitation which is going to come, yes. the tribal seat is going to increase, scheduled uh, reserve seat, because uh -huh. it has to be proportionate to the population, population okay. of the ST. Yes. The population of ST have grown from 31% to 40% now, 40 point something right now, mm -hmm. in the last 61 to right now. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Maitre's population have gone down and so on. That's a fact. Yes. Anybody can check this. Yes. Now, since it is the tribal uh, population, scheduled tribe population to be precise, is 40%, mm -hmm. then the reserve seat has to be at least around four to five seats mm -hmm. more okay. than the present reserve. Uh -huh. Now, the competition is which group is going to get this? Cookies or nuggets? Yes. Yes. Therefore, there is an inflation in the uh, census in Senapati mm -hmm. in the northern side. Uh -huh. And similarly, they are trying to do it. So there is an internal competition okay. to get the seat more. Yes. And uh, I get a village, the southern tribe, these groups who are broadly we are calling a cookie. Oh, yeah. They are far more aggressive in some sense. That's why I sense it, the number of spread of villages across. Mm -hmm. And the shrinking of the Naga MLA's number from 12 to 10. Mm -hmm. All this points to uh, uh, ongoing demographic politics not involving Maitre. Yes, correct. Yes. You get it. Mm. So Maitre first gap which me. It's almost like again. It reminds me of partition stories. Mm. Uh, Hindus used to say, at least in Pakistan, "Jagra hua Muslim or Sikho ke bich me, ham log bich me first gap bol." That's something that I've discovered during the partition studies. Mm. So Maitre has been caught in this demographic politics. They're trying to increase the population. Mm. The second aspect related to this. In Mizoram, what they do is that they treat hospitality for the refugees. Mm -hmm. But as she has rightly pointed out, they do not obliterate the identity of being a refugee. Mm -hmm. They keep them as refugee, mm -hmm. but they are still hospitable to them. They're the same people as in China. Uh -huh. But you know, look at these dynamics. So when these people try to acquire birth certificates, Aadhaar card, these people will come you know, Jora, as you said rightly, how did there's this pop star called Summer or something, you know, who was born in Cookie, uh -huh. a Chin State in Chin State in Burma, uh -huh. but came to Mizoram. He's one of the most popular singer. I see. So he got an Aadhaar card mm -hmm. and a birth certificate from one of the villages. Wonderful. So the Mizaus themselves were saying, the, How did you get this? Mm -hmm. So there are voices within Mizoram who say the refugees are refugees and we are citizens. There should be a distinction between the two. Aren't there some professors who are born in Burma? And let's Minister. skip that one. I said, no, what, what, what I'm saying is this treatment mm. that let's be nice to these refuses, but let's not forget that there are refuses. Mm. They are not citizens like us. Okay. This is, seems to be the uh, attitude in Mizoram. In Mizoram. In Manipur, either you are denying that there is no whatsoever refuses or infiltrations or migration of that kind. You are saying that all these population are within Manipur. Mm. That means whatever have increased, there is a tendency to call them as 
indigenous or citizens. Yes. You get the point? What yes, I'm absolutely. And why is it so? It is related to the first issue. So the more you have it, so that is incidentally found out by a cabinet subcommittee mm -hmm. yes. headed by within called a Kuki MLA, Lepao yeah. okay. from Tenglopal. Uh -huh. And they discovered there are villages, new villages being established by mm -hmm. these new. This is a new uh, yeah, illegal immigrants. The past 10 years? But no, no, no these are new, 2000, recently, you know, recent ones. So he went and, uh, you know, they found, this committee found these illegal, this thing, but the yeah. report was left midway. Yeah, but the, the, the second cri crisis started when the second yeah. uh, survey was about yes. to begin. Okay, mm -hmm. so there, this population dynamics, you know, I'm again trying to remind you, this doesn't mean I want to be clear on this, that I do not want to point finger at my fellow citizen as outsiders. But they must be genuine like the Mizos in Mizoram mm -hmm. that infiltrators are infiltrators, illegal immigrants are illegal immigrants, refuses are refuses. I get the feeling that in Manipur they don't claim. They, they claim that they are part of but once you know, settle people down, establish villages, how do you define... How, no, no, how that's why the second part, I just wanted to take one more issue which Remy has flagged off uh -huh. about forests. Forests, yes. Uh, you know, there's a national policy which says that, you know, two thirds of the area uh, must be declared as preferably uh, a forest area. That's uh -huh. a national policy. Mm -hmm. In Manipur, the declared forest area is barely around 24 percent. 24 percent. Only 20 percent. It's a totally forested state, isn't it? Yeah, but it's, it's a large part of a forest area. Mm -hmm. This is the one fact that we must keep in mind. Many of these people are saying that it is illegal, you No know, surveys has not been done. These are lying to the teeth. Mm -hmm. They don't even read the act properly. To declare certain forests as a protected forest, you need not have the survey to begin with. Mm -hmm. It is an emergency measure. You think that if you do the right. survey, or these things will be infiltrated and occupied by the illegal immigrants or anything. So in order to protect the Forest Act, give the power to declare it as a protected forest okay. without doing survey. Okay. But you are obliged to do the survey later on, one. And second, you are supposed to take care of the people who are found in those areas, their right must be respected and negotiate, you know, negotiated or whatever is to be legally done and you know, all shifted to some other places if they are illegal immigrant from the other countries and that has a different dimensions to yes. that one. All these things are given. The argument has been that the surveys have not been done. Mm -hmm. And then some of them are saying also that there is a hill area committee must be given approval. Mm -hmm. What they forget is that much of this declaration except for one or two of them, came after 1972. I think the only one I am aware of, if I am wrong, you, I stand corrected. But as far as my knowledge goes, there's only one declaration afterwards. Rest of them have the last one declared was in 90 something. Mm -hmm. But majority of them, except for this one case, was done in 1966. Okay. So they are conflating these data by saying that, you know, all these things have been declared without the approval of Hill Area Committee. They don't realize that Hill Area Committee came in 1972, mm -hmm. declaration were done in 1966. Mm -hmm. So these are confusion. And then some of these mm -hmm. argument about uh, settlement officer, which is provided by the Forest Act of 1927, there is no post called assistant uh, settlement officers. So in Manipur, some Karaf officials have done something. So this government tried to correct it. They have suspended some of these officers. And mind you, this is not only about these tribal areas or forest areas. This is even in the other areas in the valley as well. Okay. Uh, nobody has an issue with this. Why is only this was been made an issue? I think it is linked to this demographic mm. politics. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, this in order to have more spread you need to claim because the declaring a forest will stop you from doing that one. Yes. So I get the feeling that symbolically, therefore, if you think the genesis of these violence, which the national media doesn't cover, uh -huh. and I'm saying this again, uh -huh. please send any damn journalist, whether it's a Christians or Americans or Catholic, if you don't trust, or, or any Hindus or Muslim, please send them and check whether it is true or not. Mm. The burning of forest offices started all this thing right from April onwards. Mm. Why do you target forest office? Mm. Think of the reasons. Mm. On the day of the rally itself, there was forest offices been burned. 
You mean the early May? No, this May 3rd. May 3rd. When, when the uh, violence started. Yes. There were forest offices were burned mm. on the same day in the morning. Mm. You see, so you should know this, that there is violence and people are saying that, you know, you don't realize this. Where was the violence started? Mm. National media didn't cover it. Mm -hmm. You have images. I'm just holding back because let the inquiry committee, if you don't trust this, any independent, again, I'm saying this, so-called progressive forces or genuine people, whoever is wanted to go there, please shake it and close, keep your hand on your heart and check where was the violence when where did it begin right on the third itself also check it mm. and then you will realize that so this does it justify the reactions in Imphal? for me no the state should have the job of the state is to control the violence absolutely Yes. Whether it is the government of India or because you, otherwise it will be in a Hobbesian world. Hmm. Everybody fighting against us, you know, they, we need a civilized order. Yes. So, but to paint is it as a uh, one sided violence done by these, you know, majority on the other is completely missing the narrative. The Metis are not even the majority anymore. They live in six. This is also funny. Yeah. I'm saying it that 40% is the population of the tribe and Maite is the pillar courting 53. It includes the Pangal. Mm. If you remove that, Maite is around 43 to 45%. Mm. Then think about a 40 to 45% of a population box in 10% of the land. Actually, it's 6% if you remove the lake. Yeah. Then you have the remaining 40% getting expressed. Who is being marginalized here? Absolutely. And in another 20 years, what is going to happen? Yeah. Where is this population going to go? Mm. You know, but again, like, you know, like you said, you know, that uh, we have to start with the basics of what is happening, yes. you know, and for me, th if the Myanmarese government accepts, mm. you know, that there is infiltration, you know, then I think we are doing a really bad job in convincing anybody that there isn't any infiltration. Yes. So infiltration is a huge problem. You know, there's demographic change for whatever the motives are, including, you know, motives of having more seats or, you know, gaining more power. You know, that as well plays a part. But also, I think this just this need, uh, we've also ingrained a lot of uh, victimhood in people you know so i understand when he says that i'm you know he's clarifying that you know i don't mean cookies who are citizens of india because the general no i mean uh, so, uh, sorry that, <laughs> that cookies are a, a part of india apart from the infiltrators i understand what he says because that has been said to me multiple times that oh so if you are against infiltration are you saying you're against the cookies yeah, See, that, these are two very yeah, different things. Trap. You know, infiltrators are infiltrators. Yes, yes. You know, whoever they are. Whoever they are. Yes. I don't care if, uh, you know, uh, uh, whichever from, community, whichever, by community the way. whichever country they were coming if from. If they want to call Maitais as well, I said, if uh, Maitais is an infiltrator, because mm. there are Maitais also in the other uh, Myanmar. Myanmar side, yes. We'll call it an illegal. You know, yeah. our, our focus is with what? Our focus is with, uh, uh, you know, at least from where I come from, is on national security. Yes. The fact that I have seen Manipur in relative peace yes. and I've seen it in conflict, you know, more than a decade ago. Mm -hmm. You know, therefore, we want to see it back in a state of peace. Uh, we want uh, uh, everybody in Manipur to be happy or to have equal rights. You know, the motive is not to call somebody out and say, oh, we don't cons consider you a part of the state or a part of this yeah, country. No. You know, for example, the government uh, has asked for biometric evidence. There is a huge amount of hue and cry against that. Okay. You know, mm. so why should you object to imaginary things? How is a biometric, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a biometric record? going to affect your citizenship. Mm. If anything else, it's going to have record, you know, so that we avoid future situations yes, like yes, this. Yes. How is calling an infiltrator, uh, you know, somehow impinging on your rights as a citizen? So this is where mm. the deficit in logic in this argument comes. And this is why I feel more and more observers are starting to think you know that there may be different motives attached to it. Yes. What are those motives? What could those motives be? Like, uh, I think he made it very clear. One of it is demographic. The demographic. Demographic change. Yes. Uh, number two, you know, this, I think this sort of rivalry also yeah. has uh, now taken a new place. 
you know there was a time yes there was you know some amount of connectivity and there was some amount of uh, historical reference to each other clearly that isn't there any longer it's gone it's gone yes. and of course after this fault line uh, after this conflict the fault lines are going to be deeper than before but that we can talk about later but i think this sort of uh, demographic dominance you know this sort of uh, uh, wanting to uh, wanting to have a special status uh, i think plays a huge role you know and uh, uh, that is what is threatening the maithi community as well mm. you know because e you can find to like you said the valley which yes. is possibly not even 10% less than yeah, about 6% right? 6% yes. you take out the infrastructure you take out uh, loktak lake you take out these places That's true. less than that mm -hmm. number 2 um you know you have this uh, new you know what they talk about the delimitation mm. you know that makes the maithis feel threatened as well because yes. this is obviously not the population that is historical population of the state this is new people new people coming in you know number 3 uh, there's also some amount of um, you know in typically when demographic change happens there is some amount of fear that you feel of your identity and cultural identity whether you give it weightage or not you know you start feeling marginalized yes but also there are many other smaller reasons you know like uh, when the uh, cookie groups went into the sue agreements you know mm. where are the sue camps mm -hmm. the sue camps surround the valley mm. there are what 14 sue camps 15 15 the ring fence the valley yeah, you know they surround the valley yes. you know so this sort of demographic change which is uh, you know which is hinged upon a uh, rivalry yeah. and then you are enclosed in an area like this yes. and we've seen what has happened you know uh, the su agreement has been uh, violated time and again yes, you know right. one of the rules of the agreement was no recruitment yes you know we know that recruitment yes. has been happening you yes. know uh, also you know uh, the surrender of arms you know we know those arms are floating around today yes you know so what it means it would be very difficult for me to imagine a community not to feel threatened yes. or marginalized yes. in a situation like mm -hmm. this and uh, uh, clearly with uh, great scholars from you know uh, our brothers and sisters amongst the cookie community who are not willing to accept that this is happening yes you know it defeats their own purpose so let's talk about su this was something that was signed in 2008 the suspension of operations and it it kind of disarmed the maites but allowed the cookies to have their camps and their weapons what was this all about no uh just just before that i'll talk about this but i think uh, we as i i like the way remy puts it is it's a fit their purpose if you give on this kind of narrative in conflict we don't realize that the the sufferer will be the same people okay. they will mm -hmm. suffer we will also suffer i mean we i mean the maites i am talking about it and second one is very few people seem to understand two things about maites today one they don't not only feel threatened but they are very very angry i have never seen maites so angry in my life and it's alarming for me people like me I'm telling you because I've seen, I've talked to people, I've been visiting home uh, and meeting people. You know, there's a very sweet Maitai practice. Uh, the mother, uh, even when I'm grown up, and she expired last year, you know, and when, till the time she was in a position to remember and others, she will always bite my hand before I leave. It's a sign of whatever is going to harm you. Yeah, is yes. i am already You're protected, to protect yeah. things so it's a very sweet practice mm -hmm. and people cry when they remember it. i also felt it even at this age because the first time i visited after my mother died is this year to attend his uh, her annual uh, ritual mm -hmm. i felt that's the first time in my life and i came out in the 80s is the first time that i didn't touch somebody's feet mm -hmm. which i have always done it before i leave my place mm -hmm. or she biting my hand mm -hmm. Ironically my wife started doing the same thing to me now whenever I go out so I've seen youngsters asking women who are not not their relatives to bite their hand because they want to go and fight I have never seen this before not even the 80s 90s never and I can tell you that my taste not only feel threatened and they also feel very very angry and there is a reasons for this before i talk about so that's why i think okay. we shouldn't miss we talk about burning churches and temples and so on you know you remember that unlike the abrahamic religions mm -hmm. maitais as you 
pointed about Shintoism and Buddhism. Polytheistic, yeah. So Maitreyas has that uh, correct uh, last part of it, mm. including the Brahmins who have this, every household carries Hanami, yes. including the Brahmin family. Yes. So one of the, uh, you know, two very important sacred sites, one is in Kogru, Kogru. one is in Thangzing. Yeah. Whether you even, I believe that even Maitreyas who are converted to a Brahmic religion like Christianity, mm. In some deep corner of their heart, they will not be able to despise these practices as pagan practices no. among the Maitreyas. Mm. Though you might call them as impure Christian because of that one. But I believe that, you know, if the cultural training is that. I mean, I'm just trying to emphasize the importance and how deep rooted Kauru is to one sense of being. It is the origin, our origin. Where is it located? It is, is in, in Senapati. No, it's in Kangpokpi area. Now. So it's not within the valley? It's not in the valley. It's a hill. Okay, so what's happened there? So that part, our Thangsing, there are incidences where you're not allowed to climb that. Mm. There's a ritual climbing. It's almost like asking a Christians or a Muslims not to visit the holy site mm. like Mecca, Medina or, or Jerusalem mm. or stopping Hindus from going to Kedarnath temple. Mm. What would be the reaction? You just tell me. Mm, yes. Just feel for a moment. Yes. I, this many people, especially in the rest of the country, don't realize. Mm. And three, four years back, already this issue has started, desecration of that place mm. and control and you know, not allowing to climb to pray to Thangzing mm. and changing the name of Thangzing as something else by the other group mm -hmm. and claiming that Kauru belongs to it. And despite all these practices for uh, okay. generations and generations we, we, we have in, in, in the lifetime as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and Maitreyas are not. Uh, that Abrahamic religions to denounce our old practices. We still incorporated in our way of life. Mm. Uh, they don't realize how offended and angry my days are. Mm. And I'm saying it through you. Mm. If you ever have an, a, a very sensitive observer, and I'm saying this as an alarm citizens, I don't think this anger is good. It's not good. For us even. Yeah. But the fact that they are angry, the Maitreyas are very, very angry. People laugh at it now. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, if you laugh at it, but laugh as you wish, but this fact will not change. And if anybody thinks that a population which constitute a singular population of 43% or so, and you think that who has a centuries of memories of have lived and practices like this, they're going to lie down and accept an assault on them will be a mistaken assumptions. You to... might be able to defeat them at this moment, but the time bomb will be ticking for days to come. Are you afraid we're going back to the old days of militancy and all that? Uh, that also is another dimension like when I visit. Hmm. If in the government of India makes any wrong move, the sense of alienations, you remember that it's ironical. Maitai's army officers have won the highest gallantry yes. award like Ashok Chakra. Yes. You know, for fighting the Taliban's and you know that one major got it who is a Maitai. The first three star general from the entire Northeast is a Maitai. Mm -hmm. Your armed forces officers that serve to the cultural icons, your contributions to the national cultural scene, mm -hmm. theater, cinema Sport. and dance and cultures and sports. Mm -hmm. And if you think and simply because they don't take up arms and do violence, that you somebody have done violence, you award them with the statehood in the 70s, 60s. You think somebody flex muscle and use arm and Maitreyas will lie down and accept it. If you Maitreyas react, now that you know there's a reaction and counter reaction. But I think this, if somebody knew, this doesn't justify, again, I'm reminding all of us here, to justify the counter violence even. I'm only saying that do not tell a one-sided story mm. where the violence begin and why is that the Maitreyas are so threatened and so angry and your nomenclature of minority, majority, tribal and non-tribal Hindu and Christian, you are missing this concrete reality 
that a population of 43% was boxed into a 6-7% as you said it yes. and the remaining 40% get access to the entire thing and above that you flex an insult on the sacred side like Kobru and Tangzing, and then Maitez is going to accept it calmly, you are mistaken. And that's what I sense it when I go home. Why these youngsters are ready to go and kill themselves? Because others has arms. You are going with a matchet or a, a knife or anything. They are ready to go and fight. Why is this? Why is so much angry? The end product is if you do not resolve this violence and continue, neither the cookies nor the maites or anybody in that state will have a peaceful life. It's a perpetual conflict. So whether you wanted to create a perpetual conflict, a simmering tension and mistrust for the days to come, or you want to stop it and then think of an alternative way of resolving it, is any intelligent person should have thought about it. Now, as far as Sue, so, if I come to that, it's linked to this entire dynamics. I think she has already mentioned. This is surrounding the valley. So why have the Meite armed groups been disarmed, but the Kuki armed groups been allowed? No, no, no. I, I think it will be wrong. Meite's armed groups have not been disarmed. I know there are groups, armed political groups, who are still not in talk, but I heard that some people are about to have talks. Uh, arms have been looted from the police stations, yes. or some people say gift away, whatever. Uh -huh. But you should also not, before that, we, I, I am one of the person who have been saying, why is it people in the rally camp for asking for gun? Mm -hmm. I have been saying this from the day one. Which relief camps are you referring to? All this relief camp in the valleys and so on. Uh -huh. There's Maitai especially. Okay. Why they are asking for gun, not food? Yes. Because they feel that it's the f they have been fired upon mm -hmm. using sophisticated weapon. It's happening every day, isn't it? So, no, no, I'm saying the initial part. Initial. So you should know how, where and how the violence begin. Let's talk about it. So that is why these frustrations. And now you are saying that this, if you want to blame the state government, yes, that's true. Yeah. You should not allow people to loot police, but you must also know the dynamics why the people are got so desperate to get armed. But again, the narrative is looting of arms happened both in the hill, in Tegnopal it happened. But why you are only harping on one part? Mm -hmm. Why these guys are looting these arms? Mm -hmm. The only thing I can complain is that the state failure to control the violence. One of the failure is their engagement with these Sioux groups. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The state responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, why suddenly this uh, violence started and even when the Home Minister visited, there is a simultaneous attack on the villages. Mm -hmm. So there, now that the uh, reaction has gone from going up and killing each other, everybody is armed in the state now. That's alarming for me. Mm -hmm. Everybody is armed now. Mm -hmm. But the origin, you must track it down. Mm -hmm. This is not a normal fight. Mm -hmm. Why are these armed? First violence started. It. Firing, how did it start? What happened on 3rd of May? So that is, that's what I said, the rally, when the rally happened. In Churachandpur. The forest office were burned. What Why is that? Happened? I have already told you. What else happened in Churachandpur? Then I said, you know, then where, and I'm, no, I'm just saying it, that where this burning down of... If you have a disagreement with the government policies, what makes you burn down people's homes and houses? Indeed. And it happened before. I can tell you that it is not reported. It happened in Moray, mm. attacking Maitai's house. Mm -hmm. Are there any Maitai's left in Moray? I'm just reminding you, some couple of years ago, there was no reactions in the valley. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay. But yeah. this time it's different. Mm. So if some people might have thought, this is what some people from the ground told me. What some people might have thought is that we have burned down and threatened them and did something in Moray before and these people in the valley, they are Vaisnabite and they will sit back and do nothing. And probably that calculation must have been misfired this time, is what I was told by people from the ground. That's one of the reasons. But now my only complaint is that the government should have been proactive and avoid such kind of a reactions from the valley as well. It's no justification. But in the same breath, you should be very clear about what are these shoes are. Mm -hmm. If you allow the shoe to go on and use this arm on the other communities and you speak nothing, then you know you are not playing the game. So I think the shoe should come in in this context. What is the purpose of shoe? 
I was told by defense officers and police officers that the armed surrender, they said even maybe 60, 70 percent of those arms are unusual. Yes. Okay. Those outside. I see. There could be a lot of arms. I see. And then one of the army officers told me, if you look at the continuous rounds being fired, all yeah. these yeah. 60, 70, ammunition hai? Exactly. Where so did this come this from? This I can corroborate. Mm. Out of this is what some officers told me when I talked to them. Yes. No, this is exactly what I heard. I spoke to mm. some, uh, uh, you know, defense people on ground, mm. people who were even involved in the sewer agreement. Mm. And they said that the weapons that were surrendered were already rusted. Mm -hmm. And now they've been sitting for this long. Mm. They're not usable. Right. You know, but the arms that are floating around are very advanced. Very sophisticated. Automated, mm. sophisticated weapons. And like Sir said, where is the ammunition coming yes. from? You know, so again, this is one of the reasons that one ends up casting doubt mm. on the real motives. Right. That, that's what, you know, what, what the national media didn't cover is this. When you have a police vehicle bulletproof, it's been fired upon and it is piercing through that bulletproof vehicle and you are saying that this is a village guard firing double barrel guns. <laughs> Who's going to believe that? Yes, correct. Mm. Now, uh, what I'm saying that that's the whole source of this violence, the involvement of the gun. Mm. And I think this is that uh, something that we must take into account. It. You keep on trying to paint. This is true. This is a fact that the, the Maites have been armed now also. Mm -hmm. But you know, you said looting police stations that is, or even giving them with Aadhaar card has been uh, doing round. Mm. But I said, why did you allow that to happen? Mm. That's a state failure. Mm. But that narrative should not be used to cover up the fact that people have been fired upon. Yes. Even today, people can't walk in the field. Mm. Mm -hmm. They have been fired upon. When this retaliation comes and counter retaliation and retaliation, this has been going on. And then you paint it as a one sided conflict. Yes. And you paint it as if one group of people only died. Mm -hmm. And you are comparing number how many people died and how many people don't die. It depends on the situations. Right. Mm. And some people will say, don't count there also. And it is convenient. You said, what? I know I'm, I, she suddenly reminds me. One gentleman told me, no, why should we think about where did it begin? Mm. Does it matter? Because the narrative is that majority and Maitai has done blah, blah, blah. And to remind where this violence, who begin this? Is it important for you to burn down people's houses because you have a disagreement with the government? Okay, you burn the government offices, forest offices is fine, but you, I mean, fine in the sense that you are disagreeing with the government, but why burn the civilian houses? Yeah. And where did it begin? Third, with what time? Three o'clock? Four o'clock? Was there any violence in Imphal that time? Tell me any record in the newspaper or on videos. Violence started around three, 3.30. I have met them, I have seen the recording, not only me, a lot of people. When I saw the video of the burning houses, it was not sunset. In the video, it's clearly not sunset. Mm. In Imphal, the violence was reported even in one of the newspaper, I think it is in Indian Express, uh, in one of the article, did talk about this, that the violence erupted in Imphal in the evening. Mm in response to what had happened there. Mm. You see, this is something, but now what I'm saying is that I'm only mentioning this because of the one-sided narrative, but not to justify counter-attack and uh, attack, because I think that longer this violence is, the tragedy will increase. Yes. And, and, but for some people, it seems that this tragedy should increase, only then your demand can be achieved. You see, that's the motif. I felt that's, very bad about this. That's what I said with uh, the scheduled tribe inclusion also. Dissent cannot turn into anarchy. And now this is anarchy. And any, um, you know, any citizen with integrity, especially from this region, I say this, has to understand that, you know, the kind of repercussions this kind of a situation can have, you know, and the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of agencies that can get involved. Uh, in India's internal matters because of the conducive environment that you're creating. You know, we've known that in the Northeast, a lot of insurgent groups have, and this is a fact, have been, uh, uh, you know, backed by China, have yes. received training, yes. have used uh, routes 
and cousin tribes in mm. Myanmar to reach you know Yunnan. Uh, Yunnan. Yes. Uh, we know, uh, forget Myanmar, we know that even ISI trained uh, insurgents in Bangladesh. Bangladesh. We know that these borders are porous. Yes. We know that um, uh, infiltration not just of people seeking refuge, but of insurgent movement and drug trafficking yes. is immense. That these borders are very difficult. 1640 kilometers of just Indo-Myanmar border is very difficult to man. Yes, it is. Right? Yes. So if you really, you know, have integrity, you will say that as a civilian who lives on the border, this is my responsibility as well. Because I have seen multiple cases, whether it's in Tripura, whether it's, you know, uh, the Kachin women who have become informers you know, for our forces or out of their volition, inform the forces that we've seen so-and-so coming in, we've seen so-and-so coming that. And that becomes a major component in solving this sort of a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, number two, how do you know that, you know, the people that you are welcoming aren't exactly the kind of factors that have come in before into this country, yes. you know, as destabilizing factors. Yes. Number two, Manipur, Mizoram, these are some of the states that are at the highest rate of uh, drug trafficking, drug usage. You know, at one point, they used to be huge. One of the, they were topping the list for HIV. Yes, uh, syringes, yes. Because of the syringes yes. that they were using. Yeah. So, you know, this making this environment conducive for uh, the benefit of, and I won't even say all of them, you know, I have heard some, uh, uh, you know, I have heard some people from the cookie community who are very rational about this, you know, but the miscreants, let's say, because, you know, when uh, weapons float around largely, you know, it's not people like you and me who are going to use it, you know, it's people with a certain bent of mind that are going to use it, yes. you know, so those people, you know, who have vested interests, maybe because of the power politics of it, maybe because of, um, what they gain financially out of it, you know, making the environment conducive for all of these elements to come in, making it a national security issue for observers like me. And I think, you know, they have to hold whether it's their community or not, but they have to hold them responsible. If civil society ta doesn't come on board for any sort of re reconciliation or any sort of consensus based on actual facts of the matter, no reconciliation is going to happen. Yes, right. No, I think that the one-sided narrative that I've been saying, it is aggravating the uh, issue and then painting one committee. See, let's accept there has been a tendency to brand the cookies as a generic uh, in the recent years. Mm. But what people forget is that you have been branding and villainizing Maitais for decades. Yes as if the entire development issues is because of the Maitais. Am I implicated in that? Is the community implicated in that? Even the language that people talk, it's been like this. You have been creating this narrative. If you have been genuinely worried about your development issues, you have a much more objective ways to deal with it. You don't do it. You have been painting Maitais as some kind of a villain. Uh, and usurping all of them, forgetting the factors that I have already discussed before with you on, on topography, on demographic and planning models and you know, new patrimonial structures. There is law and order situation. These are objective. Any economist will tell you this one. Instead of that, you have been communalizing, you're painting Maitais in a particular. Then you have been insulting on deep-rooted religious practices and beliefs of the Maitais, such as in Kogurus and El, much before this violence. So Maitais have been simmering anger. There have been attack on, on Maitais and you know, threatening in, in mores and burning down of houses of that. It happened before. And similarly, this border area between Tran and Champur has you go and talk to those people, how those the shops have to be closed down and because of there is a practice of certain kind of religious practice on the day of how the stones were thrown in so i'm not surprised that the violence started in and around that place mm -hmm. okay now there has been aggressive postures of this kinds what i sense is and it has not gone down and then similarly maitais have increasing which i have never seen increasingly become more and more aggressive mm -hmm. And the end result, come what may, it is not going to be good for people in that state from either communities. Absolutely. I hope these people who are taking these postures 
petty games they don't realize partitions have happened in india but it is within the country you cannot have that partitions but you think that after that my days will have a goody goody feelings if anything happened against their long cherished idea of a unified manipur mm. uh with people happy there will be lot more maite who will fight against the conservative attitude among the maite towards the tribal population and so on uh, because times have changed there will be there bound to be instead of grooming and positive vibe among dara cookies who call us up mm -hmm. is it but they, their voices are in fact there's a cultures of that one the descent among them will be hard to come up there is also particular situation among these communities mm -hmm. it is likely that my taste will have a uh, dissenting voice is being expressed more yes. Yes. but others you may not find that one you will find dissension within hindus but not yes, outside so, so yeah. I, at least i know about my taste mm. very clearly ma yes. but others you may not find it yes now what i'm saying is that i for me you know while talking to two of you is because you're not from that place although i am also practically have spent more years of my life outside my home state mm. uh, you know it's, it's, i mean it's almost like two third of my life i have spent here okay. only one third i spent in that part of the world mm. so what i'm saying is uh what i see is two things as i think remy had said about manipur was doing well you have so yes. pointed it out suddenly it has turned upside down yes you know the, there was a time there was no electricity properly i used to file an appeal in the high court and so on you know even though i'm sitting in delhi mm -hmm. electricity have improved economic and people have it was a thriving it was yes. suddenly it has derailed and yes. this tension if you think that by granting one autonomy and others will resolve no it is not going to it will be a cementing of a longer conflictual moment mm. it will linger on it will be like lebanon constant civil conflict war. civil war even if you mark the market the territorial council the hurt that this violence has created if you don't stop it earlier is nobody is going to gain mm -hmm. and i'm saying that whoever has started the violence whoever has done all this mischief they have a very myopic visions if you think that the normal civilians would love to have a perpetual conflictual relationship they are mistaken because people in general will love to have a peaceful life economic development i think this violence has threatened right the relationship i am very sad that some of these tribal group have even issue that you should not talk to you know have any alliance relationship you know i saw uh, only day before yesterday mm -hmm. and that is not going to help in the long run so i think uh who started it how started it i am only mentioning because of the false and one sided narrative but the end product is that try to understand some of the dynamics i think you know i think it uh, i agree with you i've spoken to a lot of maithis i've spoken to a lot of cookies and the general feeling that i get from the maithis is that they offended by this one sided narrative you know yes. and they don't understand why there should be a one sided narrative because the maithis have never had a conflict with the cookies this is the first time which in certain places you call it a respond mm. threshold yeah you know you reach a point where you finally respond there's a word in manipuri if you talk to you know i have heard this often from young old women men hemankre moi se hemankre menge this is too much yeah that's the response so it didn't threshold. happen when kobru happened there were a lot of anger mm. but all these things have come down yes right yes. correct but uh, you know the situation that it is in it's almost like uh, you know again like i said like there are vested interests that want to keep this prolonged yes you know so that they can come to the kind of conclusion that they want having said that i must also point out that you know any sort of fear of any territorial ambiguity should be put away even by the maithis because i think uh, when the home minister visited manipur he made a statement that there will be no territorial bifurcation you know and i think uh, in a larger sense everybody understands the strategic importance of money yes you know therefore any boundary will not be played with mm. or be used as something to appease a community i also think that everybody is very aware that the maithis will not stand for it yes you know that's that's very clear i come when i go to no home 
it will aggravate and i'm saying that will leave a deeper alienation you have asked me you know it will again see in history they have you have been insulted as even the home secretary pillai said right there was a naga arm movement so you create a state maitais who have been peacefully demanding the statehood what they call it restoration of responsible government because they had an assembly you have insulted them you keep on saying that you don't have uh, that population is less how can you be in a state blah 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 but nagaland was created despite having no experience population was less literacy rate was much more below so maitais have suffered this time if this violence is going to be rewarded by any kind of uh, you know uh, move concessions now if the maitais have resented mm -hmm. and chances are very high that lot of them and you might begin to hear radical voices including anti india voices might come up Which uh, which will generate all over which again. Is, which is why I feel because which it, is why this is so so sensitive. This so sensitive, but which is why I feel that uh, the government also understands this. Mm -hmm. You know, they have observed the whole Naga insurgency very closely, brought it to a point where development has trumped yes. conflict. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which also was a demand for a separate state, a separate nation, which encompassed all these states, and there also, you know, that was put off the table. Of course, you know, this agreement that hasn't been completed is. Only with I M, and which yes. has you know certain uh, this thing, but they are also in negotiations with K, K and uh, you know the other splinter groups because they realize that any sort of territorial uh, ambiguity in this area is not going to work, yes. and therefore I think they will not allow it to be replicated. Moreover, so in Manipur, because Manipur truly is the gateway it is. for us to Southeast Asia, yes. you know, and uh, that is why there were so many. Uh, expectations out of Manipur. It was going in the right and, direction. And you know, like Sir correctly said about uh, uh, hill areas and development, and if that is your issue, and which I think, yeah, if that is the issue, that is a considerable issue, and that is an issue that must be looked into. But there are ways and processes in which you demand, you know, for further development. But then, how does it work? Yes. You know, if development happens, you will have migrants that will come in. You will need to open up land. You know, you will need to, you know, live side by side. No, none of this. You, uh, you know, you're not going to want this to happen. Then how can you demand for more development? You know, number two, like I said before, you have the hill councils that are already vested with a lot of powers. You know, <coughs> you basically just need to learn how to use uh, uh, better. You know, you can make a lot of decisions about your own administration, except a financial decision. But over and above that, you have. Things like income tax waiver. Hmm. You know, you yeah. have 31% reservation in administration. Yeah. You know, in education. You know, there isn't anything that hasn't been done. Look, I would love to have this kind of. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, even think about you reminding me about income tax cut. Hmm. <laughs> I don't get that. Yeah, benefit. I would love to. Have I love sort of that. I'll be you know? richer. Who says that? You know, I don't deserve this kind of. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. but the fact is, you have it. Yes, they have it. You know, yeah. and therefore that is something to uh, feel privileged about because I don't have it. Mm. You know, you don't have it. You know, so I would expect you to meet the most of that. Which you have, you know, you see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, representatives of the Koki community in very high posts. Yes, you do see them. And uh, uh, you know, in I fact, the percentage you check, if you do an all India survey, even in Nagaland close, you see how the advanced tribe and the minor tribe, their presentation in the decision making bodies in the bureaucracy, and compare it with Manipur. Mm -hmm. Check the literacy rate, check the infant mortality rate, any criteria you choose. You will be surprised. Your whole narrative of tribal backwardness and deprivation will change your picture if you see the facts and figure. Right. We don't do it, but I, I think this again reminds me again that if there are genuine issues, this is not the way to address. Okay. This is, if you have a development issues address, they said you know we have tried. How did you try? Said MLA will raise issues. Uh, no, I, I'll give you one example, which is again some of these media campaigners have distorted what I've said. In using ironically the same example which I had in mind, there is one gentleman who was honourable uh, ex MLA races when he was an MLA on 24th August, the last session of the 11th State Assembly. This is right now is the 12th Assembly. 
This is when the election is around the corner. Campaign had started six months before that already for this 12th assembly. You will raise the issue about tribal funding and many of these things also been double, you know, in a smart way, you camouflage some of the words. You have a separate budgeting. Now the government had come out uh, after that uh, thing also. But what I'm saying is that when the budget was discussed, this should have been raised. But this was done just before the election on 24th August, last session, the last day of that assembly, okay. 12, 11 assembly, and uh, referring to budgets in 2018 and the 19 and so on. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, that question, he is also pointing to that cabinet minister who is a tribal affairs and hill affairs man. He said two questions he asked. Did you raise this non-utilization of fund and so and so forth in the cabinet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And two, he said, did you consult us in the Hill Area Committee members? He was asking a very genuine question. Yes. You know, so I'm saying that when you say about political dominance, okay, that you say 40 is unreserved. You have to look at in the operational and substantive part. Mm -hmm. Tell me the decision that they have taken, which disadvantages or against the schedule tribe. Don't use this number only. You have to say concrete terms. Mm. So I said and raise, if you have a development issues, I have been saying this. Please institute to refer two things I said. I have lobbied with you know, Sri Ibobi. I have lobbied with Birin, uh, this present CM as well. Please institute a high level committee. Check these two things. I said, irrespective of tribe, non-tribe, check it. What are the socio-economic and educational status of different communities in the state? Number one. And two, is there any differential bottlenecks in the different areas of the state? Find out ways to overcome these things. This should have set up an objective way to engage with these issues rather than succumbing to this vested interest identity politics. You have never done it. And you think that by creating attentions and violence, I keep on remembering this quote, you know, since I'm not very fluent in Hindi and Urdu, but I love when somebody recites me this. Ye Rahim Prem Dhaga Mat Toro. Have you heard that? No. You know, this is a famous couplet in Urdu. It's roughly translated. The relationship, the love relationship mm -hmm. can be broken. Mm -hmm. ah. But once it is broken, you can still connect it. Mm -hmm. But dark mm -hmm. yeah. you will have that note mm -hmm. will continue. Yeah. Right. So you have created this violence. It will take generations to, if you do not have a very concerted effort to reconciliation and, and peace, this is going to, but all this thing for development, to discuss development, which could have been done other way around. And you think your children can be happily lived together by fighting perpetual conflict. So I think this is those people who are doing, I, I hope sensible citizens across communities understand this. And for the rest of the countries, this is part of India. Yeah. And you think that a burning uh, at Manipur is not going to be is not going to be an advantage for the country oh, too. Yes. So I am I am very unhappy because of this one sided narrative. Simply because you have aggravated the situation rather than dousing the flame as a third party to come in and help the people or your own citizens. You are aggravating by taking sides, and I think this harm is the price is going to be paid not by this mainstream, but the people in that state. I so, think that's the thing that I think my appeal would be that sensible people, if a democracy, uh, development issues, you can handle it differently. If there are any genuine issues, it can always be in a civilized world. You can always have a negotiation and talk but senseless madness and violence helps none. Absolutely. You I know, think this must be understood. What I remember when I used to travel a decade and a half ago, the first thing I noticed about Manipur was you don't see a certain age group. Mm -hmm. You know, so you'd not see the age group post school, you know, right into, you know, uh, their middle years. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it was because of the conflict, mm -hmm. you know, because what are they going to do? You know, there they used to be a curfew post four o'clock. You couldn't go to most places. Yes. In the last five, six years, seven years, I started noticing uh, young people coming back, mm. restaurants popping up, yeah, that's, um, that's you know, and wonderful, absolutely. like with My modern, modern aesthetics, started. you know, in Ukrul Jesa area, mm. which was considered a hotbed because of yes. I am, 
uh, there was chocolate being made there. Mm. It was really good chocolate, you know. I see. <laughs> uh, and it was being sold and it's being sold across the country. Right. Now, what happens to all of this? You know, and yes. this sort of perception, a state in conflict, the perception, the image of it takes a very long time. Even if conflict subsides today, yes. you know, the image of it will remain in people's minds, you mm. know. The Northeast uh, from conflict uh, traverse to relative peace, therefore tourism increased, development initiatives in increased, mm. infrastructure increased, yes. Manipur which would uh, not have direct flights today has I don't know how many, many a day, flights. Yeah. you know, no things much. like that happened. When I came out on flights, it was a hopping flights, Imphal, Guwahati, Bagdogra, Patna, <laughs> Lucknow and Delhi My God. and three times a week. week. <laughs> this today, I go early in the morning, deliver a lecture I and catch a flight in the evening. Yeah. I can come back. Yeah, yeah. There are many flights to... Mm. You know, but all of this happened because of the peace yes. yeah, that's that true. we saw. Yes. You know, now this is going to take so long. It's going to take a while. You know, how, how are you going to come back to where you'd left off? And that's why I believe that all these people indulging in this sort of violence, you know, people with motives, with maybe, uh, you know, uh, some amount of uh, foreign uh, foundations. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason I believe that is because, you know, uh, generations have gone through that have seen that kind of conflict. You mm -hmm. wouldn't give away peace so easily. Yes. And like he said, you have grievances. There's a way of addressing grievances. And about the one-sided narrative, sir, I must also say, I see that narrative changing. You mm -hmm. know, in a positive way, I see now people starting to understand. The Northeast has always been a very complex area. Manipur, most complex in all of the region. Yes. Therefore, for people to understand that are not from this region or haven't studied this region is difficult because they don't even understand how many communities are there. But Remy, I must tell you one very popular phrase you're also using. Complex, no? But there is a simplicity in that complex life. Of course. We are deliberately creating it more complex also. Of course, of course. And there are ways to uh, look at it. And I get a feeling this. I've been observing my homestead for a long, long time. So I feel that what what is complexity? Is? I think it is partly because of the way we relate and understand things. You are right. At one level, I understand what complex. But also it creates an essentialized pictures Absolutely. but there is actually a very simple facts which we don't do it that's why things get complicated but it's a i mean complex in the state sense of you know you might be able to understand the simplicity or mm. maybe me to a certain extent mm. or maybe abhijit mm. because we've kind of observed these areas yeah. most people who are viewing this conflict mm. have zero idea of the that North that's East. that i absolutely you know? so agree yeah. therefore they have no idea about tribal rivalries mm. they have no yeah. idea about uh, ethnic differences or commonalities uh, they don't have a uh, context of the history and therefore we see people using very basic and common binaries like majority uh, Minority. minority. Even Hill Valley, I told you, no, because I went, I didn't bring the pictures here. Mm -hmm. I've asked some of them to do it. And this time again, I went I all the way where the police blockhead is there. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's like right in the window, you said Hill Valley. <laughs> People have this imagination like uh, Banaras or Lucknow, the way they see from Allahabad or Banaras to Rishikesh and others. That's how they imagine Manipur. Mm. It is absolutely not. It's, not, it's, not. Yeah. it's like you are in the mall area in Shimla and you are climbing the other part right there. Mm. Restaurant is up in the hill mm. and yeah. you are sitting in the valley called the mall in Shimla. It is like this. People don't see. I think she is right. Yeah. There are basic things but they have a simplified notion and they started looking at that binary. Right. So Manipur is in a mess. Last question. How do we fix it? What's the way forward? I think the way forward is uh, not that easy mm -hmm. because the fault lines have deepened to such an extent. Here we are talking about, you know, human beings who now have trust deficit between yes. them. Yes. I don't think that trust deficit is going to be easy to fill no matter what actions are taken. That mm -hmm. will have to come over a period of time. But I would say if you were to ask me what the technical steps would be, I think a total surrender of the arms, mm -hmm. number one, mm -hmm. no matter whether it is with the cookies or the methis, yes. somehow these arms have to be brought back. I believe that there are about 4,000 odd and you know, how do we know the numbers? Mm -hmm. We don't know any numbers of anything accurately at this point. So yes. let's say if it's 4,000, we've had an assessment about 1,500 being brought back. Mm -hmm. That's still a lot of, it's a lot of weapons, weapons know, so you know, weapons. and weapons being used again, like I said, not by people like you and me or people watching this, but by 
miscreants. Yes. Um, so I think there has to be a concerted effort to bring that back. That's step number one. That is step number one. Step number two is I think uh, dialogue has to begin at some point, not at this point. You know, I don't think right now anybody is in a position to be able to address anything logically or without emotions taking over. Yes. But eventually dialogues will have to be made. I find it surprising that, you know, Manipur is known for the amount of CSOs that it has, mm -hmm. you know, dime a dozen CSOs. Mm -hmm. Uh, in context of this violence, we haven't seen a CSO come up that has said, okay, you know, not this way, not that way. Let's ask, ask for peace at this point. Or a CSO that's come up that constitutes of people from all the communities, you know, not just the Maitis, not just the cookies, but also, let's say, maybe Nagas, no. maybe they can play a mediating role, mm -hmm. you know, so I think civil society will play a very big role in this. Mm -hmm. I know it is going to be tough for them because, like I said, trust deficit is high. Yes. But these kind of, you know, moves will have to be made. I also think that we have to hold, uh, we have to put the responsibility where it needs to be put, like in the situation of infiltration, yes. you know, uh, communities living in the border areas will have to take responsibility, mm -hmm. you know, because not just the fact that it's illegal, you know, the fact that it can create a situation like this again, mm -hmm. you know, and responsibility means um, the professor made a point, you know, about it being difficult in certain communities to go against the general stance of the community. Yes, yes. Right. Therefore, in situations like this, this may be the case that it is difficult to call out on infiltrators because that may not be the general community stance of mm -hmm. it. You know, I think you have to rise above that, mm -hmm. you know, nation above anything else that has to be. I also think at some point, you know, we have to stop asking for international interference. Oh, totally. Yes. You know, we've yes. seen uh, organizations from both ends mm. uh, send letters to the UN, send letters to the US. You know, we've had uh, uh, we've had politicians in the US like Garcetti saying that, oh, if asked, yeah. we'll... I mean, you know... How's the business? How's your business? <coughs> business? The European Union is discussing this. Yeah. In the guise of this discussion, look what they're doing. They're making it into a communal issue, which yes. it is not. Mm. You know, uh, <coughs> there's nothing communal here because, uh, you know, this is about cookies and maitis. Maitis don't even form one homogeneous uh, religion, you yes, know. Yes. So, so uh, uh, you know, this kind of simplistic view is all we can expect from them. But what will it do? It will complicate matters yes, more yes. you know when has any international body actually come and solved the problem Nothing, never. you know over and above that these are people under the guise of this are fulfilling their motives against a democratically elected government as well as the people of this country yes you know it's the same divide and rule sort of agenda what what does it say in that uh, re uh, resolution uh, that the European Union, uh, members of the European Union presented to the European Union. It says, we want the release of Khurram Parvez. What does he have to do with this? He was arrested, uh, uh, bases uh, involvement by the NIA, bases involvement in uh, funding of terror activity and okay. conspiracy. Okay. What does he have to do with this? Why is it in your agenda? Uh -huh. You know, what what does a religious angle have to do with this? Wherein you only mentioned that Christian churches were attacked. Mm -hmm. You've not mentioned temples. Yes. Right. So this sort of politicization, international politicization has to stop. Mm -hmm. And I cannot blame them when we are sending resolutions from, uh, we are sending uh, requests from here. That's right. You know, so I think that has to completely stop and yes. we have to be very vocal about the fact that there is no support for this sort of, you know, lobbying. Yes, right. And um, uh, finally, I just think that, uh, you know, we have to take a look at this as a long term situation. You know, it's a long term problem, which will need, you know, some amount of long term solution. Do we need an NRC? See, NRC, the problem is, I think NRC is a great idea. You know, many other countries have it and it's been successfully implemented. The problem here is the kind of politicization that happens with any agenda that uh, comes in, mm. which is basis national integrity or national security, the way it is looked at and the way it is politicized always creates a problem. Mm. Now, in a place like Manipur, which is so extremely sensitive right now, also has so many other layers of conflicts that are going on. At this point, NRC would be difficult, 
you know the first uh, thing should be to disarm everyone it first thing should be to disarm mm. second thing should be to get civil society on board yes third thing would be stop you know to absolutely stop trying to involve external agencies yes. in this matter you mm. know whether it is behind the scenes as well because yes. that happens very often yes. and number 4 would be to yes maybe you can think about nrc but the process that it would you know the processes that it would require need to be really airtight you know yes, not like right. in assam hmm. number 2 the date hmm. there has to the be date. a consensus on the, the date off, yeah. you know now my problem with the date is i understand why the maithi community would also want it so i understand uh, you know uh, the relevance of the date but the problem now is it's been about two generations anybody who came up you know post like 1971 as well you know has been here for about two three generations mm-hmm. how are they going to look at it mm-hmm. you know and um, you know what about uh, people who disagree on the date mm-hmm. you know that will also cause skirmishes so i generally think that this you know this is a good idea but this may not be the right time Mm-hmm. not the right time yeah i i think there's a lot more homework that needs to be done mm-hmm. in terms of a same situation like what happened elsewhere should not happen here you know because things are sensitive right now but also there are certain degrees of you know consensus that we still need to come on another thing another thing we need to do is to clamp down on any further illegal, illegal immigration you which know, is ongoing uh, one of the thing is uh, the problem is and i've spoken and i've seen these borders that they're so thickly forested yeah very really forested so they're so large the borders themselves yes. that it is extremely difficult to be Hundred percent. See, even if you fence it, yeah. you are as strong as your weakest link. Yeah, that's right. Right. Mm-hmm. Therefore, civil society has to understand the repercussions of this sort of illegality, and what are the consequences on society, and not just one community, but all communities that reside there, and take responsibility of border control as well. Right. Right. Sir, would you like to add something to the the final question? What's the way forward? I think she said it. I agree fully with this. Disarming should be the first step. Mm, yes. With too many guns are around, you know. This, you, I've been there three times. I told you, you know, I, I mean, it's unimaginable. A country like India can't afford to have this. That's right. It's like a civil war there. It is. I mean. <clears throat> I've never thought that this would happen in anywhere in this country. I have heard about riots happening, but this is not riot. This mm-hmm. is like arming everybody. You know, uh, that that must be reined in first. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think we should have a critical look at the way you have sue also. I mean, there mm-hmm. should be a ways to uh, think what is the function of that. So I think it should be part of the same disarming yes. process, yes. And, and government just should take a very clear cut stand on this. Yes. They need to um, renegotiate. Yeah, yeah. And, oh, we need to move past. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, I think I think you use the right word. You know, we need to relook and renegotiate this. Mm. That's the first. And second, I think um, uh, starting the, somewhere, the political parties. Like BJP or Congress, whoever is there, no, they must started having a dialogue among this political class. The elected, you, it's like the Cuban crisis, you know, like the uh, uh, you don't talk to each other. I think that Abhish is thinking something, and you think I'm thinking something. We build up like this. I think the uh, the good offices of the government of India must be used to make them sit across the table. the politician themselves right now among the 60 members and as me said it then you should also try to invoke the civil society for here i have a specific suggestion this i have given to some someone else also uh, right now if they don't trust each other the there should be a committee of some respectable citizens from the region particularly and i have a few names uh such as ratan thiam Uh, which even some of these people from the kuki side feel that he would be doing it janu barua could be one figure niketi iralu from nagaland very highly respected but i am very careful to mention this and i'm saying it again there are a lot of what i call it entrepreneurs of conflict management mm-hmm. they i have seen them they are taking sides and aggravates the situations yeah. mm-hmm. uh, they are these are like driven by projects and 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 they have a different motives mm-hmm. they can't be a genuine um, peacemaker mm-hmm. so i think people who don't have much stake but accept peace and their sensibility as senior citizens niketu iralu i can name them uh, ratan thiam and and janu barua maybe one or two from the rest of the country respectable figures mm-hmm. they must come in 
uh, and then allowed to visit and talk to these civil society groups rather than the government officers. For the government, use your political class to at least break the silence. Let them talk. Okay. Till under mm -hmm. 10 MLAs from Cookie side, 10 MLAs from Naga. You are not talking. No? Yes. Let the, call them to Delhi and let them sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. Even if they shout to each other, let them do it in there, inside. Yes. Uh, not talking will not help. Yes. Uh, I think that should be the first process. Whichever grievances and uh, demand they have, let them have a chat. Mm. Uh, I think the government just should use its good offices to do it. Mm. And the political parties uh, like the national parties, like the BJP or the Congress, they must also do their own bits to help this political class. Right. And I thought that they can rob in their own members from Assam, Mizoram and you know Meghalay kind of thing uh, as an icebreaker and to start and civil society this talk mm. and uh, then I think some of these uh, grievances about development issues and others I think government should form a committee right now and investigate how far is it uh, real how far is it a perceived one mm. and uh, also to look into how these real issues that come up can be addressed in a very effective manner and the fourth one is a long-term process of uh, reconciliation process. But this must be preceded by, which we tend to forget, we should, uh, uh, they should have come also along with the first few. The people who are uprooted right now, yes. I mm. think this, they must yes. be taken care of. Yes, totally. And uh, along with this, right now what I can sense from the ground, people's education, health, uh, medicine need in 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 Kangpopi or in Churanchampur or in the valley, uh, children educations along with. Uh, this is particularly true for my taste. Mm. Uh, people have not been able to work in their field. Mm -hmm. It's a very narrow window period for them to do it. Mm -hmm. They have been fired upon when they work in the field. I think government must ensure, and this is a lot of mistrust. And I think there's if you go to the ground. You will get to hear and know this. Uh, security measures is either doing it unacceptable things that the people who go to the field have been fired upon, and then that is still going on. Yes. And once this period is over, the economic repercussions yes. and yes. conflict of a different kind will appear. Yes. So I think they must ensure that uh, uh, security enough, man, not simply by words simply saying but in deeds and action yes. on, the ground, on the ground the people should be able to work on the field and finish it mm -hmm. and and ensure that those things are protected because there have been talking about this people ridiculing oh you work on the field we will get it later on kind of thing there's a teasing kind of ridiculing mm -hmm. i think there must be something on this ground All right to do it mm -hmm. uh, if you do this in a sequential, so if I have to order it, take care of these immediate health and medicinal needs and farming requirement. Yes. And then follow it up with rehab, you know, make sure that these people have enough, uh, you know, clothing and place comfort on there. Because you remember, I learned this from my partition experience studies. Violence is not uh, an event, it's a process. Mm -hmm. The traumatic experience of women who have never gone out of the house but taking bath in the camp yes. during the partition is a long standing sense of humiliation and trauma. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we must take care of these people in, in the relief camp, not only in terms of materiality but also their anger and their sense of frustration and hurt. Mm -hmm. There must be an intervention at that level and followed by immediate disarming of the groups, then the sequence follows about the dialogue okay. and so on. Can I also add when, you know, it comes to, you know, these internally displaced people, I think eventually the aim should be that they should feel secure enough to go back from where they've been up. Absolutely, yes. You know, yes. we don't want camps. People should be able to go back to their homes. Yes, right. All right, I think we've covered the issue in great detail. And yes, in that we have never solutions. had like this. So thank you so much, Professor and Rami. Thank you so much for a very okay. good discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Abhijit, Thank for, having us. for, for Thank having us here. Thank you. So that was the conversation. Hope you liked it. If you enjoyed this, please share this on WhatsApp and other media. Thank you very much. And I'll see you soon.